it's winter now, and the temperature has finally dropped enough uh, in our area that I'm using humidifiers again. It's humidifier season, and, and I'm wondering for to to, to present a, a question to our our well informed and and oddly specifically placed listener base in certain industries. <laughs> uh, I I want to know. So every winter. I get like super cracked, like hand skin, like around my nail, it just cracks and hurts. And does any, do any of these like hand cream things or (laughs) even the, even humidifiers, does this do anything? Like do do any of these things help? Is your question, wait, can I, can I like, this is kind of like the question that like uh, many young children and often some adults have. It's another secret weird thing kind of uh, in erective (laughs) parlance where they're like, (laughs) Sometimes I get headaches, but I don't believe that headache medicine, medicine does anything. Does it do anything? No, because a lot, <laughs> first of all, a lot of medicines don't do anything, so that's a reasonable <laughs> right, question. All right, all right, <laughs> right. But I'm saying, like, the, 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 the whole, the idea is that the whole rest of the world, including doctors, uh, would, would tell you, that, hey, if you have a mild headache, maybe take, like, uh, aspirin or Tylenol or Advil, right? But you're living your whole life thinking, ah, that probably doesn't do anything, right? So here you are, you've got coal, you've got, like, dry, <laughs> cracked hands, and your question is, do moisturizers moisturize? That's what it comes to. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. Putting moisturizer on your dry hands. It's like, what What kind of question is that? Or you could just not and continue to have dry hands. Now, your humidifier question is better because that's like, okay, well, I'm humidifying the whole air. Is that helping me as well? But like, but you'd stop. stop. If you have dry hands, use moisturizer, please. No, and I do. I mean, what, <sighs> moisturizer sucks because like, you know, then you can't use that hand, those hands for a couple of minutes as it like dries. All right, in well, or, now, that's a that's a better question, which is like, tell me a good moisturizer that's that doesn't have the. No, I have good moisturizers. I have I have like stupidly good ones that I love, like how they feel after a few minutes at least. I just don't know if they're <laughs> doing anything like I. You know, are they actually fixing the problem of my hands always crack and get painful in the winter? Uh, moisturizers are not entirely placebos. I'm going to go out on a limb and say that. <laughs> most moisturizers. I have to say well, most. Is that true? That's that's kind of what I'm asking. It's like, <laughs> I don't know. But, but like, yeah, I think this is, I think it's a safe bet that uh, that not all moisturizers are placebos. Is it? I, <laughs> I think it is a safe bet. I will say that. I do not have anything that really resembles a skincare routine. And I don't or say winter. that with pride. Or, right. Or, or, yeah, right. Or winter. Uh, ha, 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 ha. Or air that's ever dry enough for this to be an issue. Uh, ha, ha, ha. Yes, yes, yes. Anyway, um, I think it's going to be like the low of 15 tomorrow or something like that. So come off it. Anyway, um, I w- have tried many a moisturizing lotion in my day. For my money, and I'm not trying to say this is the universally correct answer, just for me, the one that I have had the best experience with by a mile is Cetaphil, C-E-T-A-P-H-I-L, which is not an uncommon lotion. Yeah, I've seen that before. It's all over the place. Um, I vastly prefer this because with most lotions, I feel like gross and weird on my skin. You were kind of alluding to this, but I feel that way for like 20 or 30 minutes. With Cetaphil, it dries in the span of just a couple of minutes, and then it's like, other than the fact that your skin has moisture in it now, it's like it was never there. And so I would strongly encourage you to give Cetaphil a try. Uh, I will put a link in the show notes uh, to to what I believe is the one that I use, as with all you know, medicines or dermatological things. (laughs) There's, uh, you know, a thousand variations that are all basically identical, but... um, this is what I use and I recommend. This this may or may not work for you, but again, the reason I like it so much is because after just a minute, maybe two tops, that that icky like oily feeling goes away. It is there at first, but it goes away super fast. Like how long after you've applied it can you open a doorknob? <laughs> uh, I, that's a fair question. No, it's a fair. Don't scoff at him, John. That's a reasonable question. <laughs> oh, I would say. Well, like, I think you could always open the doorknob. It's just that it feels icky to you, don't, or you don't want to get moisturizer on the doorknob. But like, no, sometimes it's genuinely hard. <laughs> if you put it on the palms of your hands, it's genuinely. I mean, how stiff are your doorknobs here? <laughs> oh, stop it. Uh, anyways, I, I would say to answer your question, five minutes or less. And how long after you apply it could you touch a like glass touchscreen and have it not smear something on it? Uh, five days? No, I'm yeah. kidding. <laughs> uh, I, that's again. I think that's a perfectly reasonable bar- barometer, and I don't. I don't know off the top of my head. I mean, obviously, neither of us, and certainly not John, would be touching a glass screen other than maybe a phone. Um, but well, I use uh, my iPad. What are you talking about? Oh, that's fair, fair, fair. All right, I take I it. Use touch screens all day long. 
That's I'd rather just avoid the need for these things because I hate having goop on me. And and also, you know, I'm always as I as I get older, I'm increasingly conservative about like, you know, what kind of chemicals I'm allowing to to be applied on my body or enter my body. Like, you know, I, I wanna I wanna like not take unnecessary risks with weird chemicals and stuff. So, you know, I I just I'm trying to figure out like are there any other solutions to this problem that don't involve gooping up my hands all day with crap that i hate uh, my recommendation is to be 100 percent italian and produce so much skin oil that you never <laughs> need to use moisturizer in your entire life well and the other thing is it works for I, me. i'm also like you know it, it, the the division of labor in our house um in in broad strokes there are some exceptions but in broad strokes uh tiff is in charge of soft things and i'm in charge of wires in the kitchen Oh, and, and dog is usually me, too. Um, but the kitchen part of my duties mean that I my hands are often getting wet and dry, you know, in cycles as I wash dishes or, you know, clean counters or whatever. And then the dog part of my duties mean I'm, all, I'm often putting on gloves, going outside, taking off gloves when I come, like, a lot of that. So, like, my hands just get destroyed in the winter. Um, but I just, I, I don't have a good solution here. Uh and hu- humidifiers don't uh, humidifiers seem to be more for other forms of comfort and for the happiness of the plants in the house. Uh, I'm not entirely sure humidifiers are doing much for my I think skin. humidifiers will help probably your sinuses and like your you know breathing because you're breathing that in the moisturizer. Hopefully you're not breathing it in. Uh, but yeah, for your skin, moisturize. This is like my annual reminder. Like nobody understands humidifiers really. Well, I mean our listeners do, but like you know regular people out in the world, they're like, yeah, I just you know I put a pot of water on the radiator and that's enough for my whole house all day and i'm like i'm evaporating six gallons a day into my house with my evaporative humidifiers and that that raises the humidity like 15 percent. like your your one pot of water on the radiator is not doing anything <laughs> let me tell you though if you are going to go outside on a dog walk and it's going to be cold boy do i have an answer for you on what you can do to keep yourself warm john can you tell me about this the chicken hat. The chicken hat is back. Did you miss out on the chicken hat before? Are you disappointed that you didn't get one? Are you still wanting a chicken hat? Well, I mean, so here's the news. <laughs> you too, could, you can miss out on the chicken hat again. <laughs> you you <laughs> may have another chicken Listen, oh, we're, this, is, uh, this is on us. We're bad at estimating how many chicken hats we need to, to order. And, and it's because we have to like... <laughs> We have to pay for these up front. So no, we, it's it's because there's not a lot of data to base our decision on on how many chicken hats we should order. <laughs> yeah, and so and so we have to buy them all up front. So we're like, oh, these, you know, it's expensive, and you got to alloy this money. And what if we buy all these chicken hats and nobody wants them? Then we're just stuck with it, right? So we kept ordering them in increasingly large amounts, uh, and then our sale ended, right? And we and we told people like we're going to try to get more as soon as we can. Uh, so we got some more chicken hats. This is not part of one of our regular sales, so there's no member-only discount code. Like, it's not... This is just a one-off special thing because we felt bad because, like, even after we sold through all our chicken hats, more people wanted them. So we ordered a bunch more that we thought would satisfy the demand of all the people who signed up and said, hey, tell me when the chicken... Tell me when the, the hat is back so I can order it. We may or may not have done that because I put them on, <laughs> on sale earlier today and I... Posted on it. Uh, posted about the hats to Mastodon. I posted to Mastodon first, and I gave those people first crack at it. So uh, you're welcome if you're following me at Mastodon. Um, and then I posted on Twitter. Anyway, I feel like we've already sold through half of the hats, and this episode is just being recorded now. So maybe by the time you hear this, they're not there. But if you go to atp.fm slash store, you may be able to get a chicken hat. And you may actually be able to get it in time for Christmas as well, because these ship immediately. Like, there's no waiting or anything. And if you live in the U.S., you could probably get one in time for Christmas if you order at the time you hear this. Or you could get there and find out they're sold out again, in which case we're sorry. But like we obviously we have no idea what we're doing with these chicken hats. Is there infinite demand for chicken hats? Should I buy one for every person in the world? I don't know. But <laughs> anyway, this is this is probably it for the chicken hats for this year, because we will have put them on enough heads for the winter. This is the winter. That's why we're doing this now. It's a winter one off winter sale. So. Go to atp10fm slash store. If you want a chicken hat, there may be one available. And also, we have, like, our leftover mugs. Like, we always keep a bunch of mugs in reserve for ones that, like, break and transport or whatever. Uh, and now that all the mugs have gone out to everybody and we've replaced any that broke or whatever, now we have, like, the reserve available for sale. So we do have a few ATP mugs hanging around as well. I think they will also ship as soon as you order one. So uh, if you want to order a mug and you didn't get one before, uh, take a look now. Yeah, I can't stress enough. I know I say this every time. I know I do. But for real, like, these hats are going like hotcakes, which selfishly is great. Yeah, don't give too strong of a speech because it could be by the time this thing is posted, they'll all be gone already. And I'll feel bad if that happens. But that's why you should follow us on Mastodon or Twitter. 
Yeah, exactly. And really, act now, because <laughs> I know that's such a cliche, but for real, like act now, because I bet you there's a 50-50 shot by that by the time you hear these words, this they, they will already be gone. In fact, there's even a chance that Marco will have to edit this very speech out of the show, because by the time he goes to publish it, <laughs> they may be gone. So atp.fm slash store, please and thank you. Yeah, for the, for the bootleg people, someone in the chat room just said that they so they ordered a chicken hat last time and they like it and they're thinking of ordering a second one. I endorse this behavior as a person who loves to have backups, but really, like this is what you're up against. People who already have a chicken hat are like, hmm, maybe I should get a second one. <sighs> anyway, they're there or probably going to be there. I'll tell you Hopefully. what, I, I when they when I first got mine, like I mean, whatever it was, three or four weeks ago, it wasn't that cold yet, and I was I put it on. I'm like, oh my god, this is ridiculously hot, and I I couldn't wear it; it was too hot. Now, as I'm pulling it over, as I'm pulling it with my dry, cracked hands <laughs> over my ears for my morning dog walks, and it's 28 degrees, now that is an appropriately warmed hat for what I am doing, and I'm very thankful for it. <laughs> Yeah, one other thing to scare people away from the chicken hat. We're also getting a lot of people who got the chicken hats to say, uh, it doesn't fit me, my head's too big. Uh, as I said when we originally talked about this, this hat is modeled on my my hat down to the millimeter. If you lay this hat on top of my original hat, they are exactly the same in every single dimension. Um, and my original hat was from Eastern Mountain Sports, uh, and it was listed as one size fits all. And like <laughs> I said when we talked about the hat originally, one size obviously doesn't fit all, but there was no sizing on this hat. There was no small, medium, or large. I have the only size this hat was ever made in, which is one size fits all. Is this one size fits all going to fit your head? Maybe. I mean, I don't know. Like, it is It is what it is. So if you get this hat and it's too small, uh, I don't know, give it to someone with a smaller head, sell it to someone. There's some people reselling their hats on Twitter saying, hey, I got the hat and I like it fine, but my head's too big for it. So if you want it, you can try it. I think that this, this one is actually looser and like it is it, it provide it accommodates a larger head than my original because my original has stiffened with time and is <laughs> thicker than this one <laughs> whereas this one is much much looser so this one accommodates larger heads than the original even though in every dimension it is the same <laughs> uh, so be aware uh you may get a hat that doesn't fit on your head in which case just give it to someone with a smaller head <laughs> Also, uh, I would like to make a request of John. He does, genuinely does not know what I'm about to say. So I received my chicken hat just a couple of days back. I went on a walk around the neighborhood. Actually, it was a dog walk in this particular case. So I went on a walk around the neighborhood, and it is quite brisk by Virginian standards today. I, I think it was like mid-30s or something like that. And uh, I put my chicken hat on, and, and I was quite happy to have it. It was absurdly warm. It genuinely was. <laughs> I'm not really sure why or how, but it was freaking warm. However, The power of even, fleece. Right. Uh, e either way, I remember us going back and forth about the correct placement of the ATP logo and which is which side is supposed to be where and that everyone is doing it wrong. And uh -huh. I think I'm doing it wrong. So can we have like an official FAQ page or can you repost somewhere publicly the correct place? to put the chicken hat. I mean, I don't want to be too prescriptive because honestly, you wear it however the heck you want. But the way it's supposed to be worn is seam in the back. Like that's true of most clothing. If clothing has a seam, very often it goes in the back, like with a hat, right? So this, I know it's confusing because people want the logo to be in the front so you can see it, but it's not. The logo is kind of towards the back. The seam goes in the back. But if you want to wear it with the seam in the front, go for it. I'm just saying if you're, if you're asking the question of how is it supposed to be done, it's seam in the back. And for whatever it's worth, I have a fish beanie hat that has a little fish tag on it and that is also in the same location near the seam in the back. And if you yeah. and if you know anything about fish, you know that they know what they're talking about with fashion. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you made that joke before I had to. Uh, no, but you had posted a profile view at some point, and I would like that profile view of you, John, to live permanently somewhere. But the problem, I mean, it does. It's on the Studio Neat page. But the problem is that's my original uh, hat, not the not the ATP. Uh, one. See, you got to do a new one, please, and thank well, why you. Why don't you model it? You've got the hat. Put it because on. Because I'm doing it back. wrong. Because I'm. <laughs> Well, you're wrong. Well, I've told problem. you how to do it now. I've told you how to do it now. So get Aaron to take a picture of you, uh, like in a three quarters view, showing the seam in the back, and you could be the model. Oh, super. A lot of people have very justifiably asked with regard to merchandise like the chicken hat, where do I put the discount code? Why isn't it working? Uh, or how can I get it? We don't do discount codes for the anytime sales like this one. We only do them for the time limited sales. 
Completely reasonable question. I meant to talk about this a minute ago. I apologize. I completely forgot. Completely reasonable question, but we only do the backup co- or the, the discount codes for... <laughs> you need a 28-character backup code for your hat. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You need, you need to send us your 28-character backup code and your Apple ID, and then you can get a discount code. No, no. Uh, only for the time-limited stuff, so no discounts on this. I am sorry about that. We I don't think we're going to do another time-limited sale until probably springtime, mm-hmm. um, but 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 nothing, no discounts on these ones. Our, our, our apologies. Let's do some follow-up. Uh, hey, tell me about recovery keys and backup contacts, please. This is in the context of end-to-end encryption. What is it, advanced data protection? Do I have that right? Uh, so please tell me more about this. Yeah, this is a question last time with the whole 28-character code. From the Apple document, they say, creating a recovery key, this 28-character code, turns off account recovery. And then it says account recovery is a process that would otherwise help you get back your Apple ID when you don't have enough information to reset your password. So there's the open question of, okay, so they're giving you all these warnings about it when you generate 28 character code and they say it turns off account recovery but what is account recovery and then they give that vague definition so oliver ames wrote in to say i have recovery key and three recovery contacts enabled on my icloud account i can't see any indication that a recovery key disables these three recovery contacts the two seem to coexist so i think i have three methods of recovering an encrypted key so that was the question last time can you have backup contacts and also have this 28 character recovery key and apparently the answer is yes or at least you can if you already had them um i guess Account recovery does not encompass having backup contacts. I guess it is, it is a different thing. Um, I haven't actually gone through the process, and I'm assuming none of us have at this point, of no, setting it up, but I believe it prompts you and it says, hey, you're about to turn this thing on. You should do one of these things. And the choices are generate this 28-character code and uh, designate people to be your backup person for you if you lose all your stuff. And apparently you can do both. All right. Uh, Ezekiel Ellen was one of many people to write in with some information with regard to um, getting a refund and how you can do that and be explicit about what you want to refund on. The context for this was one of you. Was it Marco buying a bunch of stuff or was it John? I I thought it was John and then I could swear it was Marco. It's always John. Um, Anyways, it it was John looking at, oh, it was for the the face thing, wasn't it? The AI uh, image generator thing I was messing with, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So anyways, so we were, John was asking, you know, how do, how do I know what I'm requesting a refund on and blah, blah, blah. Um, I had said, oh, I'm pretty sure you can do that in StoreKit too. You can. So I'll put a link to a tech talk that Apple did. So anyway, on this video, they talk about exactly how you can show like the, the, a, a sheet that I believe is provided by the system, but it lets you ask for a refund on a particular item, asks you how or what, what the problem is, et cetera. Um, continuing with what Ezekiel was telling us, um, you can look at any of your order receipts and there's a report a problem link at the kind of the bottom of the order. And there's also report a problem dot And on the, on the website, it shows you all of your purchases ordered by date and group by order number. You can choose request a refund and then see a list of options, including in-app purchase not received. After selecting it, you can click an in-app purchase and hit submit. And so there is a list that you were seeking, John. We just didn't know where to get it. Yeah, the secret, the, the key for me is that I was looking at these order receipts saying, why is there no place for me to get refund? And also, why can I not see a list of my transactions like in the app? Uh, on the receipt, the secret is look for report a problem, which I don't know. I just was gl- uh, glancing over that of like, oh, I don't really have a problem. I just want a refund. Like, yeah, yeah I would have done the same. Me. But anyway, that, that encompasses it. And the website, reportaproblem.apple.com, is where you can request a refund. The UI is a little bit weird, but that is the place where you can do it. And there you actually do see your transactions. There's actually many places where you can see these transactions, including on your devices. It's just not straightforward to know where they are, as anyone has ever gone digging for something in settings or whatever. is. So this uh, stuff is available. And uh, thanks to people pointing this out, I did actually request a refund for that one thing that didn't go through. Uh, and uh, I got it back. And same thing with the store kit two thing. Like, that's presenting a UI, but in the end, you are still asking Apple for a refund. The developer cannot grant or not grant you the refund. So if you ask for a refund from Apple and Apple says no, because like you're asking for a refund on like some subscription that you've, you know, used up all but one day of and you want a refund on it, maybe Apple would say no or something. You can't like the developer isn't doing that. It's Apple. Uh, the good news is that Apple pretty much gives you any refund you ask for as long as it is reasonable. So, uh, you know, you are at Apple's mercy, but they are merciful. That is true. I'm not arguing with what you're saying. However, in that video that I was talking about earlier, one of the things they say is when you do the in-app refund dance, 
you can provide Apple with some information about um, what what the user has done. And this is particularly in the context of consumable in-app purchases. So, you know, you buy a packet of, of credits, if you will, that you're using over time. Um, actually, I guess like this, you know, give, give me five avatars thing. Well, anyways, what you can do is you can provide as a developer, you can provide Apple with, oh, they've used two of their six credits or what have you. And then Apple puts that in their little algorithm, their black box that decides whether or not you will actually get the refund. I agree with you. I haven't heard uh, from from users or even the handful of times I've done it myself. I haven't heard anyone say that they've been denied, but there is some affordance in the flow in 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 and in the API to tell Apple exactly what it is that the the user has done. Yeah, and in my case, I remember I made an in-app purchase and the app just failed to give me anything for it. Mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. There, but there would be no record of that, and there's no way Apple has any information other than, from as far as they can tell, I did an in-app purchase and then I just like regretted it and asked for my money back. Right? They they'd have no way to verify the, my story that hey, I did it and I got nothing for it, which is true. I did get nothing for it; it disappeared into the app, but they just gave me the refund anyway. <laughs> We are brought to you this week by Linode, my favorite place to run servers. Visit linode.com slash ATP and see their amazing offerings. I love Linode. You know, I run a lot of servers. <laughs> you know, the ATP website runs on a Linode server. My own website runs on a Linode server. And then, of course, Overcast, I run the back end there on something like 20 Linode servers. And it is just a great web host. I've used a lot of web hosts. I've been a customer with theirs for a very, very long time. And it is by far my favorite web host I've ever used. That's why I've stuck with them for so long. You know, they have amazing capabilities. So from the server end, they have every resource level you can imagine from very small. If you you know want something really economical, five bucks a month gets you a server at Linode all the way up to really big resource needs. You know, if you need like if you have like a big beefy database or if you need like a GPU compute plan or a high memory plan or dedicated CPU plan, they have all different plans to fit your needs. And they are an amazing value at all of those resource levels. See for yourself, compare it with the competition. I'm telling you, they're the best value I've found. And they also have other other services as well to help support that. So they have things like managed backups, load balancing, and they also now have managed databases. This is a new service they recently started offering. They have other things too, like uh, object store, storage, um, which is like S3 compatible uh, object storage. I use that myself. We use it again on ATP and I've used it on Overcast and it's fantastic. Just like all the other services. <laughs> it's just Linode's a great web host. You know, whatever kind of server or service you need to host, check out Linode. Go to linode.com slash ATP, create a free account there and you get $100 in credit. You can see for yourself, try it out, see how good of a host they are. Once again, linode.com slash ATP. New accounts there get $100 in credit. Thank you so much to Linode for making cloud computing fast, simple, and affordable so that people like me can focus on our projects, not our infrastructure. Thanks so much to Linode for sponsoring our show. So we have a definitive answer on the Shero. This was brought to my attention from Ilya Berman. Um, I, I, I don't like to be that guy in revels when your friends are wrong and just gets excited when your friends are wrong. But when you're almost never wrong, like John Syracuse, I can't help but get a little excited. So here I am getting more than a little excited that apparently the Shero is for real, for real, a real thing. So Ilya points out, WWDC 2017 Essential Design Principles. About 25 minutes in, the presenter introduces the box with an arrow coming out of it, and, and the presenter says the following. The glyph that we use to represent the concept of an action is an arrow that points up and away from a box. Because the most common action associated with this glyph is share, we affectionately call this a shero. Yes. <laughs> so, 2017. Mm-hmm. It is a real thing. Right. But so here's the question. Have they been able to make shero happen since 2017? I'm going to say since none of us remembered this session, mm, I don't think it's really happening. Anyway, I, t- I talked about this a lot with Merlin on, on the rectifs that we recorded uh, that will be out sometime in the future. So you can hear more about it. But yeah, oh, uh, totally- lots of people are, uh, you know. Uh, have used inside of Apple in Apple retail uh, this uh, shortening of the thing. 
Uh, but I feel like it hasn't really caught on. I mean, that's why we had all these questions about it. That's why we ended up having two episodes of Focus. It wasn't like, oh, yeah, of course, Shower, everyone calls it that. And I'm kind of surprised that given these people are inside Apple talking about design, that I can't go into SF Symbols and type Shower. I went and did that. I mean, I made that joke <laughs> last episode, but I'm like, but if they, if they call it that, it's got to be in like the synonyms. Or, no, it's not. It's called like upward facing box arrow or some whatever it's called. So, I mean, even if Apple puts it as the thing in SF Symbols, I feel like making it catch on in the wider world, uh, you know, I mean, I, I, again, I think us talking about it may actually be pushing into that direction, much to my chagrin. So we should just move on. <laughs> <laughs> I will concede, as much as I love giving you a hard time, I will concede that the first time I remember having heard this was when Merlin brought it up on Rectifs, what, like a month or two ago or something like that. I don't remember having heard Shero before But we then. all probably did, considering yeah, this yeah, is from yeah. 2017. No, it just, I agree. It just didn't stick because it's dumb. It didn't stick. I'll leave it at that. Uh, all right. So uh, tell me about it enabling the aforementioned advanced data protection if you happen to really like Apple products. This is a joke I made last episode. I was like, oh, you know, you would think that uh, people who are into Apple and are Apple enthusiasts, they're going to turn on advanced data protection right away. And the requirement that all the devices be updated to the latest OS isn't going to be a big do- deal because all these Apple enthusiasts and these tech nerds, they are updating their devices all the way- all the time. They want to be on the latest and greatest version of everything. But the reality is, if you are an app, actual Apple nerd, what you end up accumulating is tons and tons of older devices that you just refuse to get rid of, even though you should sell them or give them away because you're using them as like test devices or you just want to have them or whatever. And so here is Quinn Nelson posting a video showing his experience of trying to turn it on. And it shows you that screen that says, oh, you want to turn on advanced data protection? Well, you got to have the latest version of all the OSs. So here's a list of the devices you're going to need to update. And he scrolls for like two pages. <laughs> yeah that's we all have a lot it. of devices devices that you've forgotten about that are not running the latest os they may be turned off asleep in a drawer somewhere and now you have to either fish them out or go to the web page and like eject them from your apple id mm-hmm. yeah that's not great i haven't done this yet i think we established earlier that none of us have but i do i do plan to but if, there, if, if it requires everything on the latest and greatest it might take a minute i mean it's not it's unavoidable like there's a good reason for them doing that not doing it to be mean the whole point is this is a security thing and if you leave the old ones on the old version that's a security leak like you you are not protected unless you do this and it, it was the same thing with setting backup contacts that you had to update everything uh, you know time heals this eventually you will update all your things eventually you'll get annoyed enough that you'll dig them out of drawers or remove them from your apple id so it's fine it's just funny Yeah, agreed. All right. It turns out that you can indeed quit the finder. So uh, John Wen writes in episode 512 of ATP, you you were asked about a quit menu item for the finder. As expected, it's a defaults right to the rescue. In terminal, enter, and we'll put this in the show notes, defaults right, com.apple.finder, quit menu item, bool true. And then just restart the finder, and suddenly you'll have a quit uh, menu item, allegedly. Yeah, it behaves a little bit weirdly. I mean... It's not as much fun as doing it in Res Edit for sure, but um, and I rem- I think I put this in one of my Mac OS Ten reviews back in the day, but I've long since forgotten about it. But when you do quit Finder through that menu item, it can behave a little bit strangely, and that sometimes it will hang, or sometimes it'll hang when it's trying to relaunch itself, or sometimes it won't relaunch itself, and you have to kill it, and then it try like I got it to to a state where clicking on it in the dock wouldn't relaunch it. So instead, I had to go to the terminal, which, of course, was already open and type the open command on like, you know, open space dot to open like Mm -hmm. the directory. Mm -hmm. And that that will trigger the finder to open. Just needless to say, this is not a supported configuration from Apple's perspective. (laughs) Uh, But the finder team did put the quit menu item there and maybe it will work better for you than it worked for me. Sure enough. Uh, Hey, Ventura 13.1 is out. It is not in beta. It is for real, for real. In fact, I upgraded uh, earlier today because I'm a dummy and I do it on the day I record. I don't know why I do this every time, but I always do. But it works, so it's okay. Uh, But the point (laughs) is... Why? Because because I'm a dummy. I just today installed Ventura regular just because 13.1 came out. That's worse. That's worse than what Casey did. (laughs) Yeah, that's that's aggressive. Anyway, I I did it because I wanted to try the Freeform app, which we'll talk about in a little bit. But yeah, I updated, I think I updated yesterday. Oh, that's true. I forgot that it was on the Mac. I was, I was, oh, I, well, we will talk about this, but I, I forgot that it and, was any place but the Mac. Because <laughs> I wanted to try it on iPad with you know, my Apple Pencil mm-hmm. and all that. Uh, I completely forgot it was on the Mac. Anyway, um, so yeah, so 13.1 brings back a relatively well hidden, but there, network locations uh, GUI, which is pretty cool. I know a lot of people were sad and upset about that, but it's there now. 
Yeah, and where it is, you go to system settings, you go to network in the sidebar, and then you scroll all the way down to the bottom, and there'll be a mysterious little thing that looks like a button with three dots and a V on it. Uh, and that will spawn a menu, and then at the bottom of that menu will spawn another menu, and at the bottom of that menu, you can edit your network locations. It's a fairly hilarious UI, but at least it's back. Indeed. So Apple Music Sing isn't just for Atmos stuff, and this is by, uh, sent us via Bill Klein. Bill writes, you mentioned the new Apple Music Sing feature this week, I think that was a week or two ago, and John posited that this is not machine learning related, but instead using Atmos encoded music objects to strip out the vocals. However, in my testing of this feature, I found many tracks do not have Atmos that do not have Atmos versions on the service that function with this feature. For example, the band Goose's last two albums, Drip Field and Shenanigans Nightclub, that's a pretty good name for an album, do not have Atmos versions on Apple Music, but if you try playing this track, which will link, or any other track on those records on 60 16.2, you will get the microphone button to strip the vocals. This fact, plus the compatibility list for this feature, which cuts off any devices with an A12 or earlier, leads me, says Bill, to believe that this is in fact ML powered and relies on the more powerful neural engine in the A13 and later chips. <laughs> can we can we just take a minute to appreciate that a jam band that I happen to be listening to recently, wh- somebody wrote in about that like referencing music like that i'm not the only person listening to the band goose which by the way i was gonna say which one is the jam band it's goose goose yeah they're okay, sure they just did a tour <laughs> with Tranastasio, like kind of together as a whole thing and and it's a fantastic tour it, both the tab side of it and the goose side of it anyway oh my god they're they're so good like if, if you if fish is like kind of in your real house but like you want something like that's a little bit more mass market palatable and a little maybe a little more like you know a, a more modern take on something similar you should listen to goose it's really good so uh with all that said somebody i think it was john put a link in the show notes that i'm assuming is from someone that worked on all this I don't know. See, the information we got last so about the, the fact that it wasn't that they're using Atmos, but the idea was that Apple has uh, access to individual tracks in the same way that they have access to those you know things to do the Atmos mixes because they have to, you know, anyway. Um, but I think it was from Vitici or somebody was saying, like, this is not uh, using machine learning to do it. It's actually they, they have the individual tracks and the Atmos was an example of why Apple would have access to that. But I don't know for certain. So a lot of people are saying the reason it's limited to the Apple TV 4K is because it uses machine learning to do this and we need the A13 or better. And that's why you can't use the older Apple TVs to do it. Uh, But I don't know if this tweet from John Druckmann is definitive because it's someone on the inside who knows. Uh, But either way, it seems to me like it would be more straightforward to just get the individual tracks. And certainly Apple, through its connections in the music industry, could get those. But on the other hand, how many songs could they get them for? Is this something they've been doing for a year, asking all the, the music labels to give them individual tracks? Or did they just apply ML to it? It's kind of weird that Apple wouldn't brag about it if they used ML. Like, hey, look at this yeah, amazing thing true. we're doing. The power of the neural engine, blah, blah, blah. But uh, still a bit of a mystery. But uh, most of the feedback we got is people saying it's definitely machine learning. Let me ask you to, you two, did either of you try this feature at all? I think we established we both can't sing, so no. Oh, no, no, no. I can't either. Well, I mean, I do sing. I don't know if I can, but I I do (laughs) in the car when I'm by myself. (laughs) When you're listening to Fish, you you say three words every 30 minutes? (laughs) Well done. I can sing other music also, um, but yeah, I... But the problem is I haven't had a lot of that time since I've upgraded to 16.2 and stuff. So so I did try it very briefly on my iPad. And I don't know how I got this impression. I, I presume I just vastly misunderstood. I thought that there was a lot to this or something more to this on the user side. Clearly, there's a lot to this on the implementation side, as we were just discussing. But on the user side, it's basically just another volume control for vocals. Maybe everyone knew this but me, but I, I, that's it. It's just you're looking at the lyrics view. Because the lyrics already did. The things you're seeing the lyrics do, the lyrics already did that. Exactly. They already looked like karaoke. Like they highlight the words as they come up in the song and they scroll automatically. That is, it existed that way for years. And they just added the ability to basically turn down the vocals. to. And, and I think one of the things that will maybe identify, I haven't tried this, but one of the things that will maybe identify is whether it's machine learning or not. If you have the individual tracks, you could put the vocals to zero and you won't hear them at all. Whereas if you're using machine learning and you put the vocals to zero, maybe you'll still pick them up a little bit. I'll have to try it. So I did try doing exactly that. Now, granted, I was doing this on my iPad, not using AirPods, just the iPad speakers. 
as far as I could tell, there was zero vocals, but uh, I very well could be wrong about that. And this was in five minutes playing about. Now, it is very slick that you can just get a volume slider for the vocal track. Like, that is cool. But for some reason, I thought it was more involved than that, and it's not. <laughs> like, that that's all it is. I shouldn't, I shouldn't say that's all it is, but that's all it is. And I, I was surprised to see that. But with that said, it was extremely well done. And if I could carry a tune, I could see it being a lot of fun to mess about with. But I cannot. All right, so uh, Marco, that Tesla that you've probably either sold or are about to sell, mm -hmm. uh, good news, you can now use Apple Music in your Tesla. Great. I expect that to work super well. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this is not them adding CarPlay, but it is, uh, you know, a, a, an improvement over not acknowledging that Apple Music exists at all. And also not acknowledging that people just play music from their phones. Like, I mean, mm, yeah. like the car has a built-in cell modem for things like traffic routing, stuff like that. It, it was only like uh, one or two years of that for free. And, and then after that, it, like you had to pay per month and I just never signed up for that because I'm like, what do I need this for? Like, I, I, you, because they don't have CarPlay, I, I never use their media stuff anyway. Like, I'm, I have my phone, you doing, you know, directions using Waze or Apple Maps, and then I have, you know, my own, my phone also playing music via or 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 Overcast podcasts over the speakers. And so, what do I need the vehicle's built-in, you know, weird stereo thing for if it's just playing a streaming service? Like, I can do that on my phone and have better integration and more control and you know, a more unified experience with the way my phone works in other ways um, and have Bluetooth connected and, and ready to go. So it was a no brainer for me. I just never used that. And so this adds yet another capability to that data stream that I don't have access to for a car I'm trying to sell. We are brought to you this week by Collide, an endpoint security solution that uses the most powerful untapped resource in IT, your end users. When you're trying to achieve your security goals, whether it's for something like a third-party audit or your own compliance standards, the conventional wisdom is to treat every device like Fort Knox. Old-school device management tools like MDMs force disruptive agents onto employee devices that slow down performance and treat privacy as an afterthought at best. And that way of doing things turns IT admins and end users into enemies. And it creates its own security problems because users turn to shadow IT just to do their jobs. So Collide does things differently. Instead of forcing changes on users, Collide sends them security recommendations via Slack. Collide will automatically notify your team if their devices are in an insecure state and give them step-by-step -step instructions on how to solve the problem themselves. By reaching out to employees via a friendly Slack DM and educating them about company policies, Collide can help you build a culture in which everyone contributes to security because everyone understands how and why you do it. For IT admins, Collide provides a single dashboard that lets you monitor the security of your entire fleet, whether they're running on Mac, Windows, or Linux. You can see at a glance which employees have their disks encrypted, their OS up to date, their password manager installed, whatever they need to be, Whether and this all makes it easy to prove compliance to your auditors, customers, and leadership. So that's Collide, user-centered, cross-platform endpoint security for teams that slack. You can meet your compliance goals by putting users first. Visit collide.com slash ATP to find out how. If you follow that link, they'll hook you up with a goodie bag, including a t-shirt, just for activating a free trial. That's collide, spelled K-O-L-I-D-E, collide with a K, dot com slash ATP. Thank you so much to Collide for sponsoring our show. Moving on, uh, we had just talked about this kind of obliquely a second ago, but the Freeform app. So this is new in, what is it, 16.2, something like that, whatever just came out in the last 48 hours. Um, this was teased, I believe, at WWDC. Do I have that right? It was, I think it was actually demoed, wasn't it? Yeah, it was, it, they showed the app. It was, it's, you know, coming soon to all of Apple platforms. So it's on the Mac, it's on the iPad. Is it on the iPhone? I don't remember. Yeah, I think it's on everything. Yeah, it was one of those features they said uh, in the Freeform app will be coming, whatever they said, later this year. It's one of those things that didn't launch when iOS 16 launched. Yeah. So this is now out. It's everywhere. And I only spent a few minutes playing with it. I don't know what in my life needs an infinite canvas sketching clip art app. 
but holy cow, this app is really cool. Like, I really, really like it. Um, so again, what it is, it's an infinite canvas, which I, when we were all together, maybe, I don't know if that was the year that you were there, Marco, but when at least the Syracuse's and us and the underscores and maybe the Armin's were all at the underscores for New Year's, this is probably four or five years ago now, uh, we did a um, a text-based adventure game like, like uh, they used to do with the upgrade Cortex crossover. Well, they still do it, but they do it differently now. And anyways, we need, I wanted to have an app on my iPad to draw a map. And it was surprisingly challenging four or five years ago to come up with an app that you had an infinite camp, a canvas that you could go as, as far as you wanted in any direction. And I, there were some that existed. And I think there was a Microsoft one, maybe one note that was actually pretty good. There were a couple others that I found, but this one feels very Apple-y, which makes sense because Apple wrote it. But uh, it's a really, really well done infinite canvas, you know, sketching app. And I really, really, really like it. If I was just doodling with no particular, like, known endpoint, um, I really, really like Linnea. I think that's how we, they were, we were told to pronounce it. Uh, Linnea, by our friends at the Icon Factory, is Excellent. Yeah, I love it too. And I would still choose that probably in most cases in no small part because of some of the tools that they have to like draw shapes very you know, free form, but auto detect them and turn them into shapes. And and I love that they have different like paper, if you will. They have like graph paper and and they have, uh, I think they have uh, like iPhone screens so you can draw mockups and stuff. And so I really recommend Linnea. If I remember, I'll put a link in the show notes. Um, but this free form thing for when you're doing freeform <laughs> doodling or whatever is really, really good. And I really, really like it. So I played with it on the iPad and there's like a bunch of things that are across the top, a bunch of tools across the top that you can play with. Um, there's like the standard pen uh, thing where you can, when you can doodle with the Apple pencil, but interestingly, the tools that you can use are a little different than normal. I think they have a pen that has a capital letter a on it. And that's basically to start a text field, if I understand it correctly. Then they have like a pen, a marker, a crayon, which was a little surprising and kind of cool. They have something, maybe John, you can tell me if you've looked at this, what this is. It looks like a like a bottle of paint, but I don't think that's actually what it is. Uh, the eraser and then the like squiggle blur things tool. They also have a ton of clip art. I don't know if that's even what we're supposed to call it these days, but I'm old, so I call it clip art. Um, they have a, a bunch of stuff on here, including like an entire farm's worth of animals. Uh, they have a waffle, which is round, which I, I, I personally believe is the correct shape for a waffle. Um, they have a food truck, which I thought was funny. They have John Syracuse's refrigerator, maybe. I don't know. Do you have a bottom <laughs> freezer or a side freezer, John? It's French doors on top, uh, freezer drawer on the bottom. Okay, then they have your actual refrigerator because it does not have water or ice dispenser on it. Uh, and they have a turntable I was excited to find. <laughs> so there's all sorts of fun clip art in here. I also liked that when I was uh, noodling about with it that I was looking to move a couple of sticky notes near each other, and I was just you know messing about. And sure enough, when they got close to each other, they they popped up alignment guides. So they would align against text. They would align against each other. And it was really, really intuitive. And it worked really, really well. This whole thing, I really, really dig. Again, I feel like it's a solution looking for a problem in my particular case. But I was quite surprised at how great this was for an initial release. And especially for something that I was like, yeah, whatever, I'll just try it out and see what it, see if it's any good. I really like it. And uh, it, you can sync via iCloud. I think it has affordances for live collaboration. I didn't personally try this, and I might be lying to you by accident. But but, that, but that's kind of the whole point of this thing is supposed to be collaboration. And by the way, it's not my fridge. My fridge has French doors on top. That's not French doors. That's just one big door. Jeez, Casey. Was it? Oh, shoot. I'm sorry. I, <laughs> yeah, anyway. the, the, offending, the offending party has been right, sacked. So the, <laughs> the, the, the fact that you used it on the iPad, you're, it's almost like you're describing a, a slightly different app than mine because my, I was using it on the Mac, and my frustrations were with the like the, the tools available. What I wanted to do immediately was, hey, this is the Infinite Canvas. I want to just scribble on it. And I could not, for the life of me, on the Mac version, figure out how to scribble on this thing. I have a pen tool, but the pen tool only lets me make straight lines, Bezier curves, stuff like that. I could not find a scribble thing. And now, obviously, if you have the Apple Pencil or your finger, it lets you do that. But on the Mac, you just can't draw with the cursor, I guess. They're just like, no, we can't. I mean, I grew up drawing with the cursor in, in Mac Paint and Super Paint. Like, it is a thing that you can do. But this app is like, no, you need Apple Pencil. 
like you need or you need a touch device i don't understand that all those things you said the pen with the little a on it the bucket that the the little bottle thing like the crayon none of that is here or if it's here i'm not finding it maybe i have to like make my screen bigger so i don't know but <laughs> yeah the only, make your screen bigger that's what you do <laughs> I'm, I'm just saying like how am i not is the window not big enough on here like when i click on so the things i see on the top is i see a thing that make a sticky note i see a thing that looks like a circle and a square and in the upper right-hand corner of the popover that appears, I see the pen tool. The tooltip says draw with the pen tool. But all I can do with the pen tool is make straight lines and Bezier curves. And then there's a million different clip art uh, things or whatever. Yeah, I see what you're saying. Then there's make a text box, right? And you click that and it immediately makes a text box. Then there's the photo thing where you can add a photo or a movie. And then there's the choose a file to add. There's no scribble thingy, you know, for just like scribbling. I don't understand it. Yeah, you're right. On the Mac, it does not have have any of these affordances that I'm talking about. And, and, and I, I wish I had, I meant to try the collaboration thing because I feel like that's where this thing really where it's really supposed to be for us having multiple people do this. But I I look at this app and not that there's anything wrong with it. It's fine, but like it it boggles my mind that Apple decided to make this because it's not like they don't have things to do. Like I can give them a list. We do. That's what they have to show us about. There's plenty of things that they could do, right? Uh, but somehow, I mean, was this an acquisition? Did they acquire a company that already had this app and they and they brought it to the Mac? Was this just somebody's good idea? I'm not that I'm saying they shouldn't do this, but it's so weird for them to decide to, to make this specific app. Uh, in particular, the the challenge that I think most of their users face when it comes to collaboratively working in a sort of multimedia environment involves communication with people, right? So like, that's why this is a collaborative tool, but like, the main communication thing that I think people use with Apple devices is one, messages, iMessage, right? And two, probably FaceTime. And this is not FaceTime or messages. It's a whole other application. Now, it kind of integrates with those other things, and you can sort of, you know, fold it into that. But I feel like the entry point should be when you're in one of the existing applications, here's a new way for you to collaborate versus come through this app and then, you know, I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong about that. Maybe this is a really important tool and, they're, and, it's, and they need to be competitive in this market because they, if they don't have, if, if they have a free thing that does this, it's really important to all their users. But it seems to me that I would much rather have the ability to have us all look at a freaking photo when we're on a FaceTime call, which is a thing that <laughs> iChat can do, but that FaceTime still can't do in a pleasing way. No, I, I agree with you. It, do you have your iPad within reach or no? No, it's upstairs. So oh, all right. Casey just sent a link for a, a test link for us to collaborate on a freeform board. I open it. It's my first run experience. I open it up, and it gives me an error that the board can't be opened. Cool. Oh, now I got it. All right, all right. Oh, I can select things. Yeah. See, so, so I mean, I, I have this. Is, I actually haven't used the app yet, but what I'm, I, I think there's there's two ways to look at you know why did Apple make this app and, and what's it going to do long term. You know. We can look at something like Clips, and <laughs> Clips basically has got, you know, it was put out there and then just left to die. Like, it just got, got no love, no ongoing support, no ongoing features. It was itself kind of redundant with their other apps already. Um, you know, you could argue, like, why didn't they just make iMovie better or whatever, you know. And and so Clips, it was put out there and then just left and and no follow up, no follow through. Um, and Apple's really, unfortunately, kind of good at at putting stuff out there and then never following through with it, and and kind of you know <laughs> getting it out there like you know eighty percent of the way and then just letting it die. So that's that's I think the the pessimistic outcome here. Like that that could be what happens here, or it could be like Notes, where Apple Notes came out. I mean, not obviously not the very original like Marker Felt one, but you know the the mod what we, the modern app that we know as Apple Notes that came out and everyone was like, huh, they. They put a lot of work into that. And then they just kept iterating it. Every OS release, Notes got a little bit better and got some new capability. And we all just started using it because it was just good. Maybe that will happen here. You know, maybe this will actually, you know, may maybe, um, what's this called? I already forgot. Freeform. Like, <laughs> <laughs> maybe this is just going to become one of those Apple system apps that, you know, it doesn't get a lot of, a lot of like attention but people just slowly start using it and then it, it, it eventually becomes this thing that yeah a lot of people just use this and they get stuff done in it and it's fine and and even though you know pe people don't often talk about it it's just one of those useful utility apps that you know people like you know like us apple users tend to just enjoy and and use as part of our day and not really think about so that's i think the ideal outcome here 
And I think that's possible. You know, even if the collaboration features, which Apple has always done at best an okay to to poor job at, um, even if those end up not being as good as something like you know what what we see from the G Suite or you know from from Microsoft or whatever, like even if it's never quite to that level, if it's good enough to be like okay usable within a small group like us or within a family, like, like, you know that's how we use notes. Like we have shared notes within our family, and we you know we have a couple for us for various various ATP things. Like if it ends up being that kind of app, then that's fine. That's great because. You know, it's not going to take over. It's it's not going to suddenly like you know make businesses stop buying Office. It's not going to make schools stop buying Chromebooks. You know, it's not going to radically change collaboration forever. But it could just be a really nice thing that Apple users get to enjoy and use for themselves and their families and and you know small groups here and there. And if that's quote all it is, that's great for it to be that thing instead of ending up like Clips. Merely requires that. It's useful to some people in some certain ways, which I think it probably is is you know on on track to that now, if not already there. And then secondly, it requires Apple to actually invest in it ongoing, to actually care about this app, make sure it has a staff of more than zero people after this week, and <laughs> really follow through and make sure that like is this getting love every OS release? Are they are they listening to customer feedback and making tweaks and making adjustments and fixing problems and addressing shortcomings? If they can do that on an anywhere near regular basis and keep this thing from dying on the vine, this could be really cool. Yeah, I, I think it could definitely benefit from... It's not like, uh, you know, I was just complaining about the feature set and I do feel like the Mac is getting the short end of the stick here, but like it's not like it needs a tons, of, tons of features, but for version one, I think its main strength that Apple should leverage is system integration, right? Kind of like the quick note thing where you can, you know, make a note by going up in the corner. It took a long time for that to arrive, but that's the type of thing that Apple can do that third-party developers have a harder time with. So this is a, you know, across all of Apple's platforms, in theory, a useful app, but it shouldn't feel so much like an island. Like it should be thoroughly integrated with FaceTime and messages, I feel like. Uh, you should be able to sort of seamlessly, you know, open doc style transition from like, hey, I'm in a message thread and now everyone on this message thread is scribbling on this document. Oh, sorry, Mac users, you can't scribble because everyone knows that's impossible with a mouse. But anyway, like <laughs> it, like you don't need sophisticated tools and, and you know, grid snapping and like it doesn't need to become Illustrator or whatever. Uh, but if it just had integration, I think I think that would get people using it more because right now no one's going to even know this app is installed. Like it comes in, it came in an update. It comes in sixteen point two and thirteen point one. Oh, don't worry, it puts itself on the dock. <laughs> I know, but like it's, it's people, that's why people have tons of things in the dock. They have no idea what those icons are. Like it's not. Whereas if it was it was like well integrated into messages, and if if the messages team would get their head out of their butts and put the uh, the thing to add a, a photo to messages back prominently placed and get rid of the microphone thing, like there's a lot of things we can do to messages to sort of find the, the most common things that people do. And when you have that real estate, you could put your new app in that position to say, we think that this is a thing people would like to do, even though they hadn't never realized it before. Like, cause they're not used to having this kind of collaboration, but just like how we put the, the one tap way to add a photo to a message thread back in a prominent place where you don't have to dig for it. Likewise, we decided that we think freeform is equally important. And so we put a little icon up on there too. And we, we put it in place of the microphone or something, you know, anyway, like put it in people's faces where they're like, huh, maybe we would like to do this. And then people find it useful for like, imagine if you could, pull up a map and then scribble on the map in a message thread and real-time collaboration on your phones, right? That might be useful. Whereas this is like a curiosity of like, oh, well, if you if you launch the app and if other people also know the app exists and you send them a link, you can both scribble together. It's like, it's more of a corporate thing. Like you, your coworkers will definitely do this and use an app like this. Although your coworkers are going to say, well, that's great and all, but we can only use the worst version that comes with Microsoft, uh, you know, Office Suite, which what else is new? But <laughs> if Apple wants to make this a thing, I feel like it needs much better system integration. I still question, like, maybe they know something I don't about a a gaping hole in the uh, the lineup of sort of default installed stuff that people get Apple devices. And, like, what I really want is an infinite canvas where I can collaborate, right? Uh, because that, but this app, like, they're not selling it. It comes free with your devices, which is great. But when Apple does stuff like that, it's to fill a need that they think is 
big. Like you get a web browser because everybody needs that. You get a mail client because it's a really common thing. You get a notes app. It's not the best notes app in the world, but it's a pretty good one. And lots of people need notes, especially when they need to write long apologies on Twitter or whatever. Like it's an important application, <laughs> right? But they don't need to include everything. Like it doesn't, in- well, I was going to say, it doesn't include like a, a multi-track audio editor like Logic, but it does include GarageBand, I suppose. Um, but yeah, the, the question of which applications is Apple going to pay to develop uh, and then give away for free as a way to add value to its devices. And that list really has to be, you know, either things that we they already know people want to do, like email and web browse, or things they're pretty sure that a lot of people are going to want to do. And maybe this qualifies. Maybe I'm totally off base about it. But right now, it seems like a bit of a curiosity. I don't know, I think this is really slick. And I saw Marco, you know, doodling in there to, to a degree while I was working in there. And it didn't didn't seem to completely fall apart. So I don't know. Again, after only having used this for a few minutes, uh, I'm I'm pretty impressed. I'm just so angry that I can't scribble. It's I, I'm I unreasonably tell. angry. I like I don't I don't understand it. Like who doesn't want to scribble on the shared placemat, right? <laughs> like, that's <laughs> that's the whole fun of it. And you guys are all having fun and doing your little messages with your handwriting, with your fingers or your Apple pencil. And here I am. I can draw like look. It's a box. It's a square. I can draw. <laughs> it's just so terrible. It's just I don't I don't understand. I don't understand why I'm being left out of the of the scribble party. Because you insist on using a Mac and putting your iPad up near your bed. That's why. Uh, I don't even I don't even currently have an iPad that I'm signed into with my Apple ID. <laughs> so I, I can't even do like I guess like I always I always want to be the kind of person who writes and draws like with pencils or pens or apple pencils i always want to be that kind of person and i'm just not at, like i i want to i end up wanting to draw something and actually doing it maybe three times a year and then I'll, then i'll take out linnea and do it on the ipad with the pencil and everything the pencil's of course dead i have to like wait for it to charge a little bit and like i i want so badly to be that kind of person because apple pencils and notebooks and pens are so cool and i'm just not that kind of <laughs> it doesn't i just take it back it doesn't even have a, like a circle and a square tool it's just got the pen tool like i can't even make i can draw a circle You're with the pen so tool or a mad. square it's just i don't understand it like it just it seems like the tools here are more limited than they are in the the what do they call it they call it markup like when you do the share sheet and you get the little pen like that seems to have more extensive tools on the mac than this does which is really mind-boggling and the other thing is, like, you can do little sticky notes. That's why I've been moving these sticky notes around. You can make a little sticky note. Yeah, but they have to be square. Yeah, it has to be square, first of all, which kind of makes sense because it stops reading as a sticky note if it's not square, although they do make sticky notes that aren't square. But anyway, um, you can put stuff on it, like text and scribbles, but then when you move the note, the text and scribbles don't go with yeah, it. Yeah, I noticed that, too. <laughs> I, that, <laughs> that is a bummer. I don't know. I, that seems like a decision and not a mistake to me because they're like, okay, if, if, st- if, they, if the stuff went with it, that makes sense. But then what if someone writes outside the edges? How does that work? So I kind of see how they arrived at this decision, but it really does break the illusion. Yep, I would agree with that. I don't know. All, all told, John gives it a triple F minus, and I give it, I give it a, a B plus, maybe an A minus. No, uh, like I, I am impressed by the collaboration ability. This is one of the first apps that I've ever seen from Apple where I can actually see you two doing things in real time, and the app isn't crashing, and it, and it seems to be like you know, I, I think I'm seeing you do stuff as you do it, as opposed to Apple's previous efforts at collaboration, which was not like that. Yeah, like when you're editing notes together with someone else, it's like, you know, they're basically sending it via carrier pigeon. Like, you know, at some point, the the person's going to see what you wrote. But I mean, well, geez, first of all, your own stuff doesn't sync that quickly between your own devices. It's like the, the problem with notes is I think it, uh, especially on iOS and iPadOS, I don't think it syncs in the background. So I think you actually have to launch the notes app to make it sync, which is, again, mind boggling to me. That's but to me, that's my number one feature request for notes. Like if they <laughs> just make notes always sync itself in the background. You are Apple. You can do that. I can't do that with Overcast, mm-hmm. but that makes sense. You, Apple, should be able to do that. <laughs> Always keep it up to date in the background. And it's not going to kill our batteries because, like, people shouldn't be sharing, like, you know, 60 megapixel pixel images. And it's like, it's it's notes. It's probably just some text. Just send it. <laughs> right. Uh this collaboration seems pretty good, although I think Notes has also gotten an update in 16.2. They, I think they mentioned that you can now see other people's cursors in Notes, which is kind of a Google Docs style thing. I wonder if that is just a cosmetic change or if they've also revamped the syncing. Yeah, oh, I mean, I agree with what you're saying about syncing, but yeah, I, I believe Notes in 16.2 adds real-time collaboration, which I have not tried yet, uh, but I've, I've understood to be pretty good. I mean, I'm, I'm looking at a shared note in 16.2 right now, but no one is editing it, and I don't know. Maybe I'll experiment with it for next week. 
We are brought to you this week by Squarespace, the all-in-one platform for building your brand and growing your business online. You can stand out with a beautiful website, engage with your audience, and sell anything, your products, your content, even your time. No matter what kind of business you are running, Squarespace makes it really easy to make a website that can support that. So from Obviously, the most straightforward an online store. Of course, Squarespace offers that. Whether you sell physical or digital goods, they have the tools you need to start selling online. Things like email campaigns, SEO tools, analytics, tax kind of integration. It's really great selling on Squarespace. In fact, my wife sells on Squarespace, and it's a great site to use for that. They also make it easy to do other kinds of businesses. So for instance, maybe you're a consultant or a coach or a trainer, and you sell time slots. They have support for that. You can sell your time. Maybe you maybe you create custom content and you want to have like a member area with gated content for people who pay for that. They can support that as well. It is great for whether you sell videos, online courses, newsletters. All of that is supported with Squarespace's business sites and, of course, tons more, whatever your needs might be. And even if you aren't even doing a business, if you just want to have a website that's really easy to design and host and looks great, easy to operate, easy to edit – Squarespace supports all of that. They have great tools. Everything is super easy to use. Great support behind it all. And you, you don't have to deal with tons of technical headaches that you often have to do if you try to host it other ways. So see for yourself. You can start a free trial with no credit card required at squarespace.com slash ATP. Build the whole site. See if it's right for you. When you're ready to launch, use offer code ATP when you purchase to save 10% off that first purchase of a website or a domain. Once again, squarespace.com slash ATP to start that free trial and use offer code ATP at purchase to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or a domain. Thank you so much to Squarespace for sponsoring our show. Hey, uh, John, tell me what convergent encryption is, please. This was something that Ben Thompson uh, noticed in the uh, Apple's advanced data protection announcement that I thought was interesting and worth surfacing. He talked about it in his uh, Stratechery newsletter. I'll put a link. This is not one of the uh, free things. You have to be a subscriber to read it. Um, but he, he, it was link, it was in the Apple document that we linked last week that's like an explanation of how this stuff works. It's talking about uh, some things that, uh, that uh, advanced data protection doesn't encrypt. And it gives some details on the little nitty gritty things here. And it says, um, iCloud stores some data without protection of user specific cloud kit service keys, even when the advanced data protection is turned on. Dates and times when a file or object was modified are used to sort the user's information, and checksums of a file and photo data are used to help Apple deduplicate and optimize the user's iCloud device storage, all without having access to the files and photos themselves. So it's saying some of your data is not encrypted. And one of the things that's, that, that is not encrypted is a checksum of files and photos, right? Like just, uh, you know, a hash of the of the, the file or photo. They don't encrypt that hash or whatever. Uh, and the reason they're doing it is for data deduplication. This is, uh, we talked about last time of like, by encrypting everything end to end and by taking the keys away from Apple, in theory, Apple doesn't have a way to scan things on the server side to look for, you know, child sexual abuse material and other things like that because they can't see your files, right? But they can see the checksum of your file. Now, this doesn't help with their previous system where they're like, uh, we have this database of known bad material and we use this what, procedural or was it perceptual hash or something? It was like a hash that was uh, saying, OK, we're looking for this photo that we know is bad. And even if you scale the photo, crop it a little bit, rotate it a little bit, make it black and white, we'll still find it. And that is a fuzzy system that is not 100 percent accurate. Uh, they can't do that because they don't have access to your photo's data but they do have access to a checksum of your photo. So if you have uh, an, an image, one of those images that's in that, that database of bad images that is not modified in any way, the checksum will match. Now, the problem with checksums and the, the reason you use checksums, the beauty of checksums is if you change just one bit in the image, the checksum is totally different. That's the point of checksums, right? So it's not really, they can't really do what they were proposing to do before because it's trivially easy to uh, defeat this by just changing, you know, one pixel in an image and now you have a totally different checksum and no one can find it. Uh, but setting all the CSAM stuff aside, the checksums will let them deduplicate because when they're deduplicating, they're just trying to save storage and say, okay, look, if we have literally the same file 700 times, let's just store it once and then just point everybody at that one 
thing. And even within your own data, if you accidentally have 17 copies of the same photo, there's that deduplicating function in photos that will say, hey, we found duplicates of this photo. It will only, I mean, obviously when you're doing with your own photos, you have access to the data, but Apple on its end can deduplicate the storage on, I was going to say on your behalf, but really it's on Apple's behalf because they pay for all that storage, right? <laughs> this lets them do that. Uh, and it's pretty interesting if you look at the Wikipedia page on convergent encryption, like how do they do that? Uh, it, it basically, they use the hash as the encryption key, and then they use your encryption key to encrypt the hash. And it's, it sounds kind of like, uh, as Merlin would say, locking your keys inside your keys. Read, read the Wikipedia page. It's not actually <laughs> that complicated. Um, but it lets them have an unencrypted version of the checksum or hash of your photo while still not knowing what's actually in your photo. In theory, this is a possible security hole because let's say there is, you know, somehow it gets out into the world that, hey, this photo has this checksum, the, you know, this exact photo has this checksum. Then they could find every single user on iCloud who has that photo in their library. But you know, again, considering if you change any aspect of the photo in any way, the checksum is entirely different. It's probably not that big of a deal. But that's why they put it in this document. If you're wondering, do they keep a checksum of your of your files? They do. And that's for uh, storage to duplication purposes. Because you know they can't be giving you that five gigabytes of free storage without doing this. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, I, I, I don't want to get myself on a tear about iCloud. Uh, storage stuff, because, so I will just let this go. But yeah, this is clever, um, and I don't think I have any particular problem with it, but it definitely gets me a little, you know, I'm tugging at my collar just a little bit, hoping and wondering if this is exposing data that I, I don't want it to, but I, I think we're in the clear here. All right, tell me what's going on in Europe these days, or soon, I guess I should say. It's not these days, but allegedly it will be happening soon. This is a confusing story. Uh, because we started seeing these stories earlier this week that, hey, uh, it, was, it was a Bloomberg, German rumor thing saying like Apple is preparing to allow third party app store or whatever things because they're doing this. They're going to have to do it to comply with this uh, EU, new EU regulation. What, what is it called? Um, the DMA, the Digital Markets Act, right? Yeah, the Digital Markets Act, right? And the, the story was Apple is working on this and it's going to be in iOS 17, right? Uh, and as Apple has said in past interviews, like obviously they will comply with the laws that they have to comply with, right? That's where the confusion begins. Okay, <laughs> what does Apple have to do to comply with this law? And the more the more I read about this, the more it seemed to me that either I don't understand this law at all, or at all, or this law is really dumb and is not going to have the intended effect. It might be both. It's a little column A, little column B, I reckon. Yeah. <laughs> so, like, so digging into this, like. As Ben Thompson's analysis was that uh, one of the important things in this law is that it says Apple has to allow third party applications to be installed or to allow third party stores. So it has to either allow side loading or third party app stores. And his interpretation was that you can do one or the other. So for Apple to comply, they can either allow you to side load, which means allow you to install applications without going through the app store or allow third-party app stores. So like Epic could have their own app store where they sold their games, right? But then other people read that same text and say, no, this is saying you need to do, allow both of them. Like people can either do A or B, but you have to allow both of them. But even setting that aside, and you keep reading the text, it's like, okay, but what does this actually mean? Does that mean that Apple has to allow this, but then they can't charge money? Well, no, it seems like they can charge money. Well, okay, does it mean that Apple has to allow this, but then they have to? Uh, they don't have any control over what's in those stores? Well, no, Apple can ask to see everything that's in the stores and be able to approve them. Okay, but does this mean that Apple can't stop someone from having a third-party store? No, maybe it means that Apple's allowed to tell you whether you're allowed to have a third-party store or not. Like, it's like all paths lead through Apple, and there's no way to avoid... Uh, you know, getting Apple's permission to do something and also paying them probably the same amount of money you're already paying them. Also, they can comply with the law so that in the end, this doesn't increase competition or make anybody's lives better. All it does is say Apple, let's Apple say, yes, we are compliant with the wall, the law. And yes, we understand that nobody likes it and it hasn't proved anything for anybody, but it's because you made a dumb law. <laughs> First of all, I, I think we, we have not seen 
anything yet with like you know what what Apple is going to do in response to the DMA. Is anything else like this? You know, is is the DMA going to you know be the way it, it is now? Is it going to be changing over time? Is the U.S. or other places going to do similar laws? And how how will they be similar? And how will they not be? Will, will this just be in Europe? And it's totally irrelevant to anybody who doesn't live in the EU, right? And like and there's I mean there's so many angles of this. Um, this was actually very very well covered by Ben Thompson in today's. Uh, Stratechery daily update. If you are a Stratechery subscriber, definitely check that out. If you are not, you should honestly really consider it. It's a very good buy, and there's a lot of good stuff there. Um, uh, anyway, so one, so there's multiple angles to the DMA, and we probably can't talk about all of them today. Like one of them is um, basically message and FaceTime interoperability requirements, and and that's I think a whole can of worms that is probably practically impossible. But anyway, I thought I thought they backed off on that one. No, I think it's still in it. I, I thought one didn't make it into the thing. I think it did. Anyway, so we're gonna we're gonna set that aside. We're just let's just talk about the App Store stuff today. Um, so I agree with Ben's take that the wording certainly says that they can allow side loading or alternative app stores. Um, but you know, and and let's assume that they won't have to do both. Um, as a user of this platform and as a developer on this platform, I would greatly prefer if they have to do one or the other. I would greatly prefer them to do side loading and not alternative app stores, which, you know, they could easily technically do that. They could just say, all right, well, we will allow third party apps to be side loaded, like, you know, from links or whatever, similar to enterprise provisioning, how that works now. Um, but third party apps can't themselves install other third party apps. That would be greatly preferable to me as a user as and a developer. I don't want to have to deal with other app stores. Uh, side loading itself brings enough you know, gotchas and, you know, possibilities for weirdness without as many downsides as third-party app stores. I do not want to deal with third-party app stores. I don't want to have to list my app in third-party app stores. I don't want to have to install third-party app stores because, you know, who, who are the, who's going to be the app stores? It's going to be big companies to leverage big apps they already own to get people to install their store so they can have more control over more apps and more of the economy. So think Facebook. Say, you know, you're going you're gonna to be required to install Instagram and the Facebook app and WhatsApp from the Facebook app store. So excuse me, the meta meta app store Mm -hmm. and these things will require the meta and then once you have the meta app store installed uh oh well actually you can get all these all these wonderful uh great deals here in exchange for selling your soul and then if that becomes popular am i going to have to list overcast there or are are developers going to have to list our apps in these other stores (laughs) and so that's that's the whole thing that both you know as a user and a developer i don't want any of that like that's that to me is 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 not good Side loading, I think, takes care of the competitive or and the the anti competitive angles here. Apple has refused to self regulate. Uh, they they have acted extremely anti competitively. They continue to act extremely anti competitively, and so this is being forced upon them, and it's entirely a thousand percent their own fault. Um, but side loading, I think, takes care of a lot of that anti competitive. Uh, stuff it it removes a lot of that pressure does it take care of any of it though like that's my question about all these requirements i look at all of them and kind of like uh gruber's most recently posted thing i look at them and i look at what i've seen of the the regulation they're trying to comply with and it's like the things the things that we're trying to solve here there's some competitive problems don't appear to be solved at all by allowing the but side loading according to this requirement because like okay so side loading it allows you know say there's some app that apple can't put on the one i always think of and the one that jason snell also thought of in his six, six colors thing is like emulators like we all love emulators for like like you were playing with that palm emulator recently why can't there be a cool palm emulator on the app store or like an old atari emulator or whatever like apple just doesn't allow emulators and nintendo emulators all sorts of emulators that you could get for the mac and the pc but apple tends to not to allow them on the app store either for you know uh, intellectual property reasons or just because they don't want you to have you know JIT compiled code or all sorts of stuff like that um so great side loading will allow those things to be on the store right but then you get into the details and it's like okay well so side loading um how are things gonna get side loading well apple probably won't allow things to be side loading unless they're notarized okay well who notarizes them well apple notarizes them and who's allowed to notarize an app well <laughs> someone who has an apple developer account and so there's like 17 different places where apple can prevent something from being side loaded not by saying you're not allowed to side load it by saying oh you can't be a developer oh i'm not going to notarize that app 
and they would still be complying with the letter of the law. And the other thing is like, okay, I don't want I want to be able to buy Kindle books from the the Kindle app. I don't want to, uh, you know, I don't Apple doesn't let me do that because I have to pay 30%. Well, now I'll be able to sideload the Kindle app and get around that. Well, no you won't because Apple still is going to want 29.9% of, uh, of the in-app purchase that you make, and Apple will still control whether you're even allowed to, uh, you know, uh, load that application by de- deleting your developer account or denying you notarization services like it's almost like the people who wrote this law didn't understand how Apple was going to react to it, didn't see all the ways that Apple could technically comply with this without giving any of the things that it's supposed to be providing. More competition, you know, cheaper payment processing, more kinds of app that Apple doesn't allow. Like, I don't know if Apple's going to do this and be this particularly evil, but looking at it, it seems like if they wanted to, they could have all the same control and the only thing this law would do, to Marco's point, is make it worse for users because now there's confusion and people are going to try to make alternate app stores. And and there will be worse security, you know, in the sense that, like, you know, uh, and uh, obviously some of this is OS level security. Um, but but like, you know, that the version of the Facebook apps from the from the meta store, uh, they're going to be a lot creepier they're, they're gonna you know stay running in the background all the time they're gonna take more of your data you know Th- that brings up the notarization thing again right so lots of things you can't do on ios is because apple doesn't let you use private apis there's all sorts of cool things that your phone and ipad can do that are like you know apis that apple hasn't published yet and so you technically shouldn't be using them and the next os update could break them but if you really really want to do you could do it but you can't because Apple scans your app for the use of these private APIs. Like even my stupid Switch Class app, I wanted to know on, on what edge of the screen the dock is, uh, even if it's hidden. And there's no API for that in the public API in macOS, but there's a private API for it. And so I tried submitting a version of Switch Class that used a private API. And sure enough, the automatic scanner said, ah, 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 you can't use that framework for knowing where the dock is. That's not public. Naughty app. Sorry. So you're like, okay, well, now with sideloading uh, or with third party app stores, I can just use that API. They can't stop me to do it, right? And I could do that on the Mac. I would just have to be outside the Mac app store, right? But let's say on iOS where you don't have that option. Now I have that option. But the notarization service that Apple runs may scan your app for private API usage to prevent security problems. And they won't notarize your app. And that will make your app harder to sideload or more scary warnings. Or maybe you won't be able to do it at all. Yeah. And, and you know, I, I think that we. We, as as both you know the tech press and as enthusiasts of this platform, we see a law like this coming through, and 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 the the reporting that Apple is going to do something maybe to comply with it. We see this as oh great, they're gonna they're gonna do what is most obvious to us, which is okay, we give up, you win. Here's side loading on alternative app stores. But what's much more likely to happen if you look at what Apple has actually done <laughs> in in relation to you know various laws that have been passed around the world in recent years um you look at the the korean thing you look at the um uh the J- japan fair trade commission you look at the uh what was the, what was the dating app one was that norway where was that uh netherlands netherlands yeah right um so you look at these at how they've complied with these and it has been like f- first of all like fighting them tooth and nail and then when they do finally, quote, comply, they do it in the most narrow and extraordinarily middle finger way possible. Because, look, Apple does not think they're doing anything wrong here. They don't think that they deserve any less than what they're getting. They don't think they should be forced to compete in the areas that these are trying to force them to compete in. They they believe they are entitled to a third of everyone's money that goes through a phone no matter what it's doing. Yeah. The only reason they don't collect everything, like they don't, you know, they don't collect 30% of your bank transfers because they can't, <laughs> but otherwise like whatever they can. Oh, they want to. I know. Whatever they can, they do. And they they are so far up their own butts about this stuff they really don't think they're doing anything wrong. And so they feel fully entitled to extract every single thing they can. So here's what they're actually probably going to do. They're not going to just do this and say, all right, we give up, you know, hands up, you win, everyone. Here, you can sideload your emulators if you want to. No. What What's actually much more likely to happen is, first of all, anything they loosen here will most likely only apply in the EU. <laughs> so that's... Big step number one, like all of us here in the U.S. and everyone else, like tough luck. It's not you're not going to have it on your phones. Then they're going to say, okay, if you actually want a developer account that can create and sign apps that will run this way, 
you're going to have to find some other way to pay us the 27% that you owe us. And mm-hmm. and the law might say, oh, they can't, they aren't allowed to, you know, pull it from in-app purchases or whatever. But the law doesn't say that Apple has to charge $99 for a developer certificate. So Apple can go right back and say, okay, actually, we now have enterprise pricing for these for these certificates. And that <laughs> means that we're going to look into your pockets and see how much money you have. And we're going to take 27% of it. I mean, they could just ask you to do that auditing yourself. Like, isn't that what they did with the dating apps? They, they would yep. just say, basically, hey, you have to tell us how many people went through your in-app purchase system that's not ours and give us 27% of it. Uh, exactly. That's exactly what they did with the dating apps. And and the, and part of the contract is they reserve the right to come audit your finances themselves and, and or, you know, have their auditors do it. Like, so... You know, there's there's no way Apple's going to just do the right thing here because Apple doesn't believe it's in the wrong. Apple believes it is a thousand percent in the right, and therefore they are going to fight this tooth and nail, and they're going to be massive d- wads about it because oh, yes. that's what they do with the App Store money stuff. They're massive d- wads, and again, they they are so self righteous. They think they are doing the right thing here because the reality is. You know, Apple as a company largely does pretty good things a lot of the time in a lot of areas. They they feel a lot of self-righteousness because they are often righteous. And that bleeds, unfortunately, into areas where they're not. And, you know, this is this is probably the biggest one of those areas where we see their worst behavior. So this is not going to be some easy thing where we just kind of get what some of us want and, and that's the end of it. This is going to be fighting tooth and nail for outcomes that nobody is really going to get what they think they're going to get. It's going to, again, look at the dating thing, the dating apps thing in the Netherlands. Did that, did anybody actually benefit from that besides Apple? Uh, that's what I'm saying. When, when they write these laws, like it's almost like they don't understand what, what the, how they can tell when they've succeeded. Like they should write on a light board. How will we tell when we have succeeded? And the answer is not, <laughs> uh, people don't have to use Apple's in-app purchase. Like, like that's not the thing people are complaining about. People were complaining that they have to pay Apple 30%, right? And there's no way apparently with any of these regulations that they can stop that from happening. So they make it difficult for everybody and they say, yay, you, you don't need to use Apple's in-app purchase but you still need to pay apple the same amount only now you have extra bookkeeping to do are you happy no nobody's happy <laughs> apple's not happy because they had to do a thing they didn't want to do and the developers aren't really happy it's like well we still have to pay like so you know the whole thing of like that there's not i've talked about this ages ago when i wrote about ebooks when i worked for the ebook company there's not another 30 percent in ebooks available to pay apple you have to pay uh, of the amount that people pay for ebooks a portion goes to the publisher and a portion goes to the seller there is not an additional 30 percent to go to the platform owner there's just not which is why you don't see ebooks being sold through the you know the the kindle app and paying apple 30 percent. it's not financially viable right so what is the solution to that the solution to allow the kindle app to be sold someplace else where they don't have to pay apple 30 percent. but none of these regulations make that happen because they don't give enough freedom. They don't They don't say, hey, like on the Mac, you could sell an app that sold Kindle books through it and you wouldn't have to pay Apple 30% because the Mac is a platform that allows you to do that. Apple does not extract 30% of every transaction that happens on the Mac, right? Nor do they do it through a web browser. Hey, if you use Safari to buy something on Amazon, Apple doesn't take 30%, right? But on iOS and iPadOS, they do. That's the problem. And they keep making these laws to try to say, can we make iPad and iOS and these other platforms like the web, like the Mac, and all these laws they write fail to do that in every way. They don't they don't give the technical freedom, they don't give the financial freedom. They just make everything more complicated for everybody and it's they're they're failing to do what they're setting out to do and I don't quite understand why they keep screwing up in that way. Uh, just to clarify something I said earlier, notarization for Mac apps does not scan for private APIs. That's App Store submission that does that. But there's no reason it couldn't. Like, there's nothing in this law that says, oh, and by the way, Apple, you have to notarize everything. Or by the way, that doesn't say anything about notarization. It doesn't get into that level of detail. Like, I feel like these, I don't know how to write laws, but it almost seems like the law should be written to say, hey, the end goal is uh, you should be able to sell things that people can run on their phones without paying Apple any money. And that's, you know, obviously that would be the most extreme version of this. And that's, you know, not what they asked for, right? Or that you'd have to pay a nominal fee, a nominal flat fee to be a developer. And then you would be allowed to sell things and not pay Apple any money. But like all these things are written such that Apple can continue to 
extract all the money and all the power at once just in different more annoying ways so again apple's not happy about it and i don't think any of the developers are going to be even even the ones that make a go of it epic makes their game store right valve makes the steam store and you know meta makes their store even if they all try to do it i think it's just going to be unsatisfactory for everybody involved uh, including the customers, right? And and developers who are like, oh, do I have to put something in the Epic Store? Do I have to put my game in the Steam Store? Do I have to, you know, it's just it's just worse for everybody. And and it's not because I like I'm for like third party stores and side loading and all that other stuff, but only if it's done in a way that actually delivers the benefits. Because what I want to happen is I want Apple to feel competitive pressure to do better. If there was competitive pressure, say, okay, well, I could put my my app on the App Store and I have to pay Apple 30%, or I can put my app on this store and pay 10%. That's competitive pressure. Now I have a place where I can get more of my money from the customers and the store takes less. How annoying is it to deal with payments? Does this store let me issue refunds directly to customers myself? That's better than Apple. Like They need competitive pressure. But every time they write a law to try to do this, they don't actually provide any competitive pressure because in all situations, Apple finds a way to say, I'm going to make sure that your store cannot possibly be better than mine. It can't be better for developers. It can't be better for users. It's just a question of how much worse it's going to be. That's not competition. That is not like the whole point of these things is we feel like Apple has too much power. If there was more competition, things would be better. And And they're written in such a way that Apple ensures that there will be no competition, as in something that that is preferable to the Apple store in some way for everybody involved. And that is extremely depressing. Yeah. The thing that I find most frustrating and to some degree depressing about all this is something that Marco had said earlier and, and that we have all touched on many times over the years, is that Apple could, I think, have gotten in front of this and could have avoided government intervention in a lot of this. But because they're so petulantly convinced that they are owed, and this is exactly what Marco said earlier, that they are owed all of this money, that they refuse to take what I think are common sense and reasonable like half measures in order to prevent this sort of thing from happening. As an example, if you were allowed as the Kindle app, for example, to link to a specific buy page you know, on the Amazon website, I think that would have made a lot of of people in this or co- companies in the situation. That would have probably been enough. Like, of course, they still would have wanted to use like you know, y- use native UIs in order to do this sort of thing. But you, you could have used Apple Pay, which does not charge thirty percent. That's true. Actually, that's a good point. But you know what I'm driving at, right? Like, they could have let you do something as simple as link to your own website. And I didn't actually realize this, but, you know, obviously up until semi-recently, you weren't even allowed to mention that something else existed in other places or, or goodness, if it was cheaper off of the App Store, that was absolutely forbidden. And I believe they've relaxed on that. How did you not realize that until recently? We've talked about it for years on the podcast, this one, the one that you're on. Oh, yeah, but I, I, I forget everything that I do <laughs> right, ever well, anyway, and always. Y- you did know. Past Casey, no. Past Casey, knew. Current Casey had forgotten. But anyways, um, yeah, so the, there are things that they could have done to make this less egregious and to make themselves seem less obnoxious. And that's the thing is for a company that I really enjoy, despite all my complaining about it, I don't like it when they're bullies, which is probably more often than I give them credit for. But certainly when it comes to the App Store, they are freaking bullies. And I don't like it when they're just obnoxious. And that's exactly what this is. It is just obnoxious. And it's so wild to me that the same company that does something as delightful as Freeform can be just such jerks. And I know it's different parts of the company. I know it's a big company. Like, conceptually, I can understand it. But it just it kind of blows my mind that they can build these amazing products and this amazing software sometimes. And yet, they can be such turds about the App Store. And it didn't have to come to this. It didn't have to come to this. And yet, they looked at the government's of every country on the planet and basically said, F*** you, try me. 
And that's just not going to work, you guys. It's it's not going to work. You are not going to win this battle. But here we are. They think that because they did this genuinely incredible stuff back in 2007, they think, what is it, 15 years, 18 years later, that they are still entitled to all this money? Like, oh, my word. And I could not agree with you both more. Like, they will get their money. They will find a way. Well, that, that's why I said it's not going to work by challenging the governments, but apparently it is because the, the government can't write laws that achieve the desired effect. Like, <laughs> fair, like, fair, like fair. The de- desired effect is increased competition because when there's competition, Apple feels pressure to make their stuff better. And right now, when they don't have that competition, they don't feel pressure. Like the, the pressure to do all, like, you know, the pressure from developers, like, oh, you take a lot of my money, you give me poor tools, you don't let me refund my developer, uh, my customers, you know, you don't let me even know who my customers are, you don't reward me for being a good developer app review is capricious like all the things that that the developers have complaints about the reason those complaints just go so poorly addressed over years and years is there's like the the developers are captive audience where else are you going to go the app store is the only thing competition will make apple's products better competition from android has made the iphone phenomenally better if android didn't exist and it was just the iphone who knows if we'd have copy and paste now i mean that's an exaggeration (laughs) but like like it's competition and obviously it's hard like when you're a company why would i invite competition like that makes my life more miserable it makes me make less money uh it puts more pressure on me uh you know if you're a company you don't like competition so that's why when apple's presented with these laws is there a way we can comply with this law without increasing competition in the market at all the answer is yes okay we're gonna do that and that's what you're both characterizing as being a big jerk but it's really just like any company that saw this it's like we have to comply with this law should we do so in a way that gives our competitors advantages against us? No, of course not. They're going to, they're going to, you know, and I agree with you, Casey, that they could have avoided this regulation by, by, you know, giving earlier or whatever. But I think they have correctly calculated that no one knows how to write a law that will actually increase competition in the market. So like, they'll just let them write the law. And then when they're done, we'll be able to comply with it in a way that it just proves our case that is this was a, see, this was a bad idea to begin with. You have an increased competition and everybody's sadder, right? And then they could use that, see, well, we had to comply with the law, talk it to your lawmakers. I know everything is worse in the EU now on your iPhone, but it's not our fault. And we told them this wouldn't do anything. Because there was a way to comply with it without increasing competition. And I'm a big proponent of increased competition because there's lots of places where Apple needs competition to drive them to be better. If they're so confident that they are so amazing, if if the App Store is so great, if their developer experience is so great, if their in-app purchase system is so wonderful, then it should stand up to competition. We all know that it won't because it charges a lot of money and doesn't have a lot of features and annoys people. Same thing with App Review. And what we're hoping for is that if there was another store that could compete against Apple, they could just do everything a little bit better than Apple in the areas that developers care about, and that would be competition. But it doesn't seem like this law is going to make that happen. It's just going to make things. It's going to make things more difficult for Apple to comply with it. But mostly, it'll make things more difficult and confusing for customers, and possibly more difficult and confusing for developers. Yeah, it just it bums me out so much that that they're. I, I, th- this entitlement just is gross in that they just wouldn't listen and, and just get ahead of it. Give us, give us an inch. You know, we're, we're in, in hell and the, the a drop of cold water would have been amazing. And I mean, yet they, they have given several inches. They, they released the in-app purchase. They did the subscriptions. They do improve things. But the thing is like, those are like concessions. They were trying to stave off like dissatisfaction and trying a little bit to stave off regulation, but they would never go, they would, wouldn't go far enough to actually stave off regulation uh, again, like I said, perhaps correctly calculating that the, the regulators will not understand the problem well enough to write regulations that actually increase competition. And so far, that's been true. Regulators have done a bunch of stuff, and none of them have had what I think should have been the desired effect, which is increased competition that drives Apple to uh, to improve to compete, to improve their products in the ways that that, that they are bad, right? They haven't had to do that. They have improved things. They have reduced the cut. They have made the App Store better in small ways over the many years, but not to the satisfaction of developers. So developers are still dissatisfied that they, you know, the longstanding complaints have not been addressed to their satisfaction, right? And Apple would say, well, users don't care because they don't see any of this. And so it's just kind of like this infighting behind the scenes, but users are, uh, you know, like the fact that there's just one App Store or whatever, because users have no idea how it works anyway, right? But this is really just, you know, a battle between 
you know, the, the competitors, developers, Apple, and other people who would want to do similar things to the App Store, whether it's payment processing or actually having a full-fledged App Store or even just sideloading apps. And users mostly are collateral damage in this battle, but it does affect them. It affects them because of all the apps that users never got to see because they did not fit into Apple's design because Apple didn't allow them because, you know, even just something as simple as for all these years, you could have been buying ebooks in the Kindle app and you haven't been able to. Maybe users don't know or care about that. But if you went an alternate timeline and took someone from that timeline where you've always been able to buy Kindle books on your iPhone and said, okay, well, in this timeline, the iPhone's been out since 2007 and you still can't do that. And they'd be like, what? That sucks. I buy them all the time. I go on vacation. I'm on the plane. I'm waiting for the waiting to board. I buy myself an ebook in the Kindle app and I'm right. It's like, well, this one, you have to know to go to the Amazon app or and have it delivered to your Kindle, then relaunch the Kindle app and it syncs with your library. And like, why do you have to do that? Oh, different timeline. <laughs> it's, it's depressing. Mm-hmm. Well, and, and I think Apple also, I mean, we've said it many times before, you know, the the app store in general really brings out the worst in Apple. Like, it represents the worst that they are. It brings out the worst characteristics of them. They introduce the worst justifications <laughs> and anger the most people with all of their their policies and comments on the App Store. Anytime they have to testify in front of, you know, Congress or a court uh, about the App Store, they always just have the maximum level of BS and the most inflammatory comments that just anger all of us. And I think they, you know, they largely are are blind to the problems here because they're making so much money. And again, for mentioned, because they feel so entitled to demand whatever they want out of the commerce that they have, quote, created on, quote, their platform. Um, but it, it is actually, you know, if, in, in many ways that John was just saying and, and in a couple others, I think it, it's actually better for Apple and their products to have more competition. It's And it's better for them to to break this addiction they have to the app store revenue and i'm not sure that they ever will uh but you know we've talked recently about like there's a lot of garbage in the app store but because apple makes so much money from it they turn the other way you know you can you can do all sorts of manipulation and scams and just overall toxic behavior that makes worse experiences for your customers but as long as apple's making 30 percent of that they are okay with it, uh, you know, and and that's that's very corrosive and and has a lot of negative effects on their products. Uh, and 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 even not like for that thing with the garbage in the app store. Some of it they make a lot of money off of it, but the other problem that they have is there's just so much on the app store that they can't actually police it all. So there's this whole sort of like you know long tail of apps that don't actually make Apple a lot of money, but there's just so many of them that the Apple has not invested enough to police them. And Apple is stuck in this place that we talked about on past shows where it's like. Uh, They want the the App Store to be a high-quality experience, but also, since they are literally the only App Store, they can't be as restrictive as would be required to make sure all the apps are good. And so they have to say, well, we want we don't want to be like the arbiters of what is it? What is a good app? What is not a good app? We'll basically allow anything subject to these rules. And that results in this huge long tail of garbage apps that are kind of scammy that don't really make Apple a lot of money. But Apple doesn't get rid of, not because they're like, oh, we need the money from those scam apps. Because the scam apps, to give the money, they can probably put on one sheet of paper, right? But Apple does want those, to be clear, right? But all the rest of those apps, the ones that most people are going to run across, the, the, the thousands and thousands of garbagey scam apps that don't make much money for Apple, but are still there, Apple can't snap their finger and get rid of those. They'd be like, ah, but like... There's just too many of them, and we don't want to be so restrictive. So, because, again, another thing that they've done to themselves, by not allowing any other distribution technique for their platform, they are stuck between a rock and a hard place of, we would like it to be high quality, but also we don't want to be so restrictive. Because when we're restrictive, developers don't like that either. What, which one is it? Do you want me to allow you, every app to be in the App Store, or do you want the App Store to be nice? And developers are like, well, we just want you to let the good apps like mine on there. But every developer says that. This is why <laughs> when you're the only App Store, you're kind of screwed. Because there's no solution to this problem other than, hey, imagine if there was competition. Then Apple could be super restricted, and if you didn't like it, go to the one of the other App Stores. But... That's not the world we live in. I think the other angle to consider here, too, is that, you know, again, Apple seems totally a thousand percent blind to any problems with with their current approach to to the App Store and to developer relations largely um, because they make so much money off of it. And, and they, they think they're gods and, the, and they're, that their farts smell amazing. Um, but <laughs> they they also rely on developers 
to make their platforms useful and and marketable and and popular. And that works really well on the iPhone because there are a lot of iPhones. That has not worked as nearly as well on all of their other platforms. That has that really has hampered the iPad in particular. Um, the Mac is a deteriorating wasteland of, of software. Um, and the Apple Watch has some third-party apps, but fairly minimally now, and many of them have been abandoned, even by big companies who have the resources to do it, um, because it's just, it's not, you know, it's not worth them dealing with it, or it doesn't work as well as they want or whatever. Apple TV never took off as a third-party platform for anything but video watching stuff. Um, They have all these different ways in the system that you can hook into the system uh, and make, you know, richer... uh, experiences things like iMessage apps um, share time share play what, yeah share play you know all these different ways they can hook in their different extension points that most big apps by big companies that people are actually using just they don't they just don't use those features and let me remind them they are apparently about to launch a completely new class of device in the alleged uh, AR or mixed reality headset family that will presumably depend to some level on people writing software for it and if they continue to run the app store with the attitude they have been running it the amount of developer goodwill they have torpedoed from indies over the years is massive and always going up and they've also angered all the big companies now so much that the big companies it for various reasons some of which are because of the way they're treated or because of the rules or because of the economics and some of which are just because big companies suck at this stuff but and because the big companies they want they want to be the rent seekers not apple like to be clear like they, they just want to replace apple in doing exactly the same thing <laughs> largely yes but and, and also more 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 so just because big companies don't like being told what to do um and, and which apple is one and that's anyway um so they're about to launch this new family of hardware at a time when I don't really see a lot of developers that will be super interested in making new apps for it because so many of us are just tired of Apple's BS and you know we can see it coming a mile away. And so it's not to say there won't be any software for it in the same way that there are lots of iPad and Apple Watch apps. Well, there's lots of iPad apps. Uh, but how many really great ones will there be? Will the next big thing be made there? Apple is so restrictive. That could really cost them in big ways that they will never know when they go to launch a new hardware platform that doesn't start out with a huge installed base. Maybe they don't care. I mean, chances are chances are they're, too, they're, they're telling themselves two big delusions. Number one, they're telling themselves, our software is going to be so great for this thing, we won't even need that much third-party software. Then number two, they're telling themselves, but the third party soft, but the third parties will line up to make software for this. It'll be great. There will be so many people just dying to make software for this that that they'll put up with, you know, all the all the crap we make people put up with, and that doesn't always happen with their platforms. That happened occasionally. Like mainly that happened with the iPhone because there were so many of them and we all use them and love them. And if they launch something new like an AR headset, that might happen there, but. It would be much better chances of that happening if Apple was better to developers and and to companies developing for them. And and they they I think they're too delusional about the, about their their own grandiosity and and generosity um, to see that. I don't think they're ever going to see that. They're never going to see that. Hey, maybe maybe like we should look at companies like how Microsoft treats its developers like way better. <laughs> like maybe there's something we can learn from, from the way other people treat developers that might result in our current and future hardware platforms having bigger and healthier software ecosystems than they have now. Uh, because, uh, you know, you look at, again, look at the iPad. The iPad has amazing hardware that has been, ridiculously tragically held back by software for its entire life both application software and apple's own os for it just hugely held back by software um and then you look at again the mac is is really you know the the mac hardware is in an amazing place they're making these ridiculously awesome mac hardware devices 
And the software ecosystem is really iffy on the Mac. It's really it's getting it's getting you know worrisome. I think the Mac example is a counter example to what you were just saying, though, because the Mac is the platform where you can uh, make a living selling software without involving Apple at all. It is the most free platform that Apple has, and still it suffers from uh, a lack of developer interest. I mean, part, and I think this is not a the Mac is suffering for different reasons than the iPad, which is suffering from different reasons than the AR headset will suffer. So the iPad suffers because the OS is so limited, and you have to go through Apple's distribution. There's lots of really cool killer apps that could have been made for the iPad if developers were allowed to sort of use the full power of the device without going through Apple. But they haven't been, so they haven't, right? And even Apple hasn't ported its pro app. So Apple is to, is to blame for that one for sure. Uh, the AR headset, if, you know, the, the first thing Apple would have to do is sell a lot of them because you need to have <laughs> you need to have the, the market out there to for developers to sell them to. But if they sold a lot of them, I think there would be a little a bit of a gold rush there. And if they were able, if it, it was if it was a hit product, developers will come. You can't, no matter how mean Apple is, if they have a hit product. So that's Apple's job on the AR right. headset. Is. That's why we're all on the iPhone. <laughs> Even if the iPhone wasn't a hit, when the iPhone was announced, all of these sort of diehard Apple developers were dying to make apps for the phone, even before Apple allowed you to make apps for the phone, even before the app, certainly before the phone was a success. The phone wasn't even out yet, and and the, the really hard <laughs> ones were dying to make stuff for it. That could also be the case with the AR headset because it's really cool. But then after that, you have to actually make the headset a success. And then the Mac... The Mac is having problems with software, not because Apple restricts things that are on it, but because Apple hasn't paid enough attention to it as a platform to make sure that its APIs are sort of up to snuff. Like it seems to, it has always been like the third place child in terms of the stuff. And Swift UI is helping sort of with the unification of that or whatever, but that's why. <laughs> Swift UI is not helping anything on the Mac. I'm sorry. <laughs> but, uh, it is because the alternative was that they were just, well, we're just not going to develop AppKit anymore. And also there's no way for you to write an application that runs on the Mac, the iPad and the phone. So <laughs> Swift UI is. Yeah, but Swift UI is totally broken on the Mac. <laughs> like it's, I don't know anybody who uses Swift UI on the Mac who, who comes away not regretting that. But it is, but it, like spec speculatively that, that that is what they're trying to do they're trying to make it so that you can use a one familiar api to more or less make uh, apps on all their different platforms whereas before you could make an app for the iphone and ipad and the mac have this entirely different thing that had been neglected for a while um, so it's 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 three different problems that have to has to address on its three different platforms uh the sort of the <laughs> this the, is not three different problems yeah it's, well no it is it is three different this problems. is one problem and it's called the app store <laughs> well no the the, the one problem because the app store again the app store doesn't limit stuff on the mac the one problem is sort of developers being cranked although well I, I think the mac app store did a lot to uh damage the relationship of mac developers and apple it did, but it also allowed uh, Mac developers like me who otherwise wouldn't be able to sell anything on the Mac because our apps are just too, you know, like there's, there's tons of uh, apps on the uh, uh, apps on the Mac App Store that are made by developers who wouldn't, it wouldn't have been worth their while to even just hook up to Stripe and do all that stuff, right? You know what I mean? Yeah, it's agreed. Like, that's like that. That's why I'm on the Mac App Store and not elsewhere because my apps don't sell enough. It's not worth my time. So they do have to be freeware which is not great. Or I can make a little bit of money uh, on the Mac app store, but that's not the show. Like <laughs> clearly, right. That, you know, Photoshop and all these big apps and, you know, BB edit going in and out of the Mac app store. Right. Uh, but, but, you know, again, on the Mac, the reason there's been that pressure and the reason Apple has done anything is because BB edit could just leave the Mac app store and say, ah, we tried it. It was too annoying. We're going back at it. And that forced Apple to come back to the table and say, Hey, we want, we would like you to come back to the Mac App Store. What do we got to do to get you back into the Mac App Store at this time, right? But they still have the problem of, you know, what do we do against web apps? All, all the apps people use every day, either web browsers or Electron apps or web views, like we're losing the battle for the desktop. Uh, but still, if you want to use Final Cut Pro or whatever the hell it's called now, uh, it's just called Final Cut, I think. No more Pro. I believe uh, you can't use that on your iPad because iPad Pro doesn't have any Pro apps like Logic Pro or Final Cut <laughs> Pro. Anyway. Uh, but yeah, no, the, the, the tax across all of this is general dissatisfaction with Apple being mean, right? And that that hurts them across all the platforms. That is the one unifying thing. And you feel that it, it has different strength. Mac users, like uh, someone who's a user or developer on the Mac may also have sour feelings because they can't get an NES emulator on the App Store, right? It's not even a Mac thing. It's, it's We're talking about iOS, right? Why are they mad about that? Well, your iOS customers probably also have a Mac. Uh, you know, or are likely to also have a Mac. And so, yeah, they're a little bit sore. I don't think that's true of a large portion of them. Yeah, and certainly all your developers do because it's the only way to make apps because you can't make apps in Xcode on your iPad yet. 
They have a, they have a lot of problems here. But yeah, and, and meanwhile, all these regulations, <laughs> all these regulations and laws and things that they're skirting are not helping. They're not helping Apple to get better, and they're not helping the market to become more competitive to force Apple to get better. Instead, it's forcing Apple to do things that they're mad about, and the things they do will make us mad. Well, and, and Apple's continued refusal to behave in a more reasonable way in some of these areas is going to make governments keep trying to make even more ridiculous laws. And <laughs> every time a government tries to make a law, that runs the risk of them really messing stuff up. And that, you know, long term with Apple, I, I think that's that's a huge risk for them. Like, look, as part of this DMA law, um, that's that was, I think, mostly theoretically about app stores and in-app purchase, they tacked on this messaging thing that is a huge problem for Apple and for all their stuff. Like, you know, and and maybe if Apple was was less anti-competitive in, in the in the money areas, maybe this whole thing wouldn't have happened and they wouldn't, you know, and they didn't have now this huge, you know, messaging and and FaceTime interrupt thing to deal with. You know, the the longer Apple goes not addressing their their worst anti-competitive behavior. And the more loopholes they they pull when these laws are passed, the more laws they're going to try to make. And and again, we we really we've been lucky in tech. Most of the time, we're allowed to kind of do what we want, and lawmakers and regulators don't really keep up, and therefore they don't really interfere that much. That has that has been largely a good thing overall. Not a hundred percent of the time, but I think overall it's been a net win. Now that tech is, is such a big part of the world and controls so much of all of commerce and business, we are inviting regulation whenever we behave anti-competitively. We have to really be careful when we invite regulation as an industry. That doesn't always work very well. And governments are so bad at understanding tech and regulators and lawmakers are so, so bad at understanding tech that... We really don't want them doing this more than necessary. We don't want them to be making laws that are going to issue these blanket regulations and requirements that actually could do a lot of damage because they don't think them through or they don't understand stuff well enough or whatever. And so it is in our best interest as an industry to self-regulate as much as possible to avoid the need for governments to do it for us. And Apple is just rolling that dice every single time that it, for any every given day that they keep going, you know, being the way they're being and then if they react to the dma the way that we're all fearing that they probably will in this weird like you know piecemeal fu kind of way where they still make all their all their tax in some way you know that's gonna it's gonna just keep happening we're gonna get more laws and and they're gonna roll the dice that that they don't get ruined too badly by them but you know meanwhile we the users we're the ones who are going to pay the price for all this Thanks to our sponsors this week, Squarespace, Linode, and Collide. And thanks to our members who support us directly. You can join at atb.fm slash join. And we will talk to you next week. Now the show is over. They didn't even mean to begin. Because it was accidental. accidental. Oh, it was accidental. accidental. John didn't do any research. Marco and Casey were Cause it was accidental. accidental. Oh, it was accidental. accidental. And you can find the show notes at atp.fm. And if you're into Twitter, you can follow them at C A S E Y L I S S. So that's Casey Liss, M A R C O A R M E N T Marco Armin S I R A C. USA Syracuse, it's accidental. So I went on a uh, self-created useless adventure over the last week and a half to two weeks, and I thought I'd tell the tale. Um, I have on my Synology... Oh, oh. See, I never had to do this with file system. I would just rely on him. He'd be there. He would catch it. But poor Casey, every time he says Synology, who knows? Like, Marco has to go into another room and get, <laughs> and get his virus slap and come back to the seat. He's not he's like, and you did this to yourself, Marco. No one made you decide that virus slap was going to be selling. You decided to do that, but you're not on the ball. The, the bell 
is one handed operation. It, it's right next to my mute switch, so <laughs> no, I can. No quickly, one made you do this. <laughs> so you the, chose this. The bell. I can. I can hit the bell with one hand so fast because it's. It's it right here. Been, it could have been the Synology bongo. <laughs> it could have been so many other things that could have been easier to have close at hand. So the vibra slap, it's it's like across the desk. So I gotta like you know lean over, reach out, reach over and get it. And it's a, you have to pick it up and then hit it with the other hand. It's a two handed operation. I understand, but you again, this was a choice you made. I feel like you didn't think it through. I gotta get one of those desktop <laughs> gongs. You could just... it could have just been the Synology clap. Your hands are right there. You know, <laughs> still two handed operation. That is uh, true. Listen, you could just smack yourself in the face. The yeah. Synology slap. <laughs> the face palm. The Synology face palm. Uh, congratulations, you played yourself. Uh, anyway, so I had a, a series of containers, Docker containers running on the Synology, and I'm not going to talk about what specifically there are, but there are four of them. Well, there's there's actually more than just the four of them, but four of them in particular were important to me. Wait, and how many of them are involved in your garage door uh, automation situation? One of them. <laughs> <laughs> because uh, one of them is uh, Homebridge, which does the interaction between HomeKit and and the garage door apparatus. Um, but anyway, so I have this th- these four uh, containers that are working in unison in order to do something, and we're not going to talk about what that something is. Don't worry about it. Uh, but those of you who know, you know. So anyway, I just dis- I realized that my you know ten year old Synology, which I love, I still love this thing. It's an eighteen thirteen plus. Uh, this was given to us for free ten years ago, or just shy of ten years ago at this point, and um, and it's getting it's getting old. Like I, I love it. I plan to to upgrade to the latest and greatest version of it probably in the next couple of months. Um, but this one was this one was free, and and I adore it as we well know. And and with that said, it's getting old and it's getting a little slow. And I think running all of these containers on the Synology was not helping things. And sometimes they would seem to fail to respond to network requests. And I don't think it was because like the containers were falling down or anything like that. It's just that the Synology was overwhelmed. And I decide, all right, I really feel like I need to move these containers off of the Synology and put them somewhere else. And so my initial thought was, okay, perfect. I'm going to move them to the Mac Mini. The Mac Mini currently hosts my media empire, which is to say it hosts channels and Plex. And it does very little else, to be honest. And yes, it is overkill to have an M1 Mac Mini to do basically two things. But this is my system. There are many like it, but this one is mine. That's a reference, John. Um, so anyway, so I decide, all right, I'm going to install Docker Desktop, the free you know community or whatever edition on my Mac Mini. And I'm going to move all of these containers, these four particular containers, over to the Mac Mini. And by moving them, I mean I'm just going to basically um, use the export features on the software that these containers are running to export all my settings and whatnot. And then I will make new instances of these containers. I will do that on the Mac Mini. Then I will import the settings and data and whatnot that I had generated off the Synology version of the containers. And I will import them onto the Mac Mini. And then I should be right as rain. And so I did all of this, and, and my, my exposure to Docker and my use of Docker is very, very limited. I'm pretty ignorant about most things Docker-related. And with the Synology, they have their own Docker like front end, which is now, now I know is kind of sort of similar to a crummy version of Portainer, but it's, it, it, it gets the job done, even though it's not stupendous. And I've occasionally dabbled with, with using, the, using Docker on the command line, but I've done it very, very rarely, and I'm very bad at it. I am aware of Docker Compose as a thing. Fast forwarding, I actually now am using it. But at this point, I'm aware of Docker Compose as a thing. Uh, Marco, since you probably have no idea what I'm talking about, it's basically you use YAML, which I don't particularly care for, but whatever. You use YAML to specify, okay, I want these containers and here's how each of these containers is going to be set up. It's it's kind of like writing an INI file, but in a more modern format. I hate YAML for the record. It's uh, yeah, I don't like it. I don't think it's very good. As it's like as picky as things are that are made for programmers, but with with none of the mechanics that programmers would expect. Yeah, well put. I I, I don't love it, and but that's not the point. That's neither here nor there. So. At this point, I'm not using Docker Compose. I am just, you know, running things either via the Synology UI or now I'm getting to the point that I'm doing it via the command line. I get everything set up on the Mac Mini. Things are going great. 
I am loving life. The Synology seems like it's working better. Maybe it's a placebo, who knows? But the Synology seems a little bit faster, a little bit more peppy. The Mac Mini is looking at these four containers and laughing like, oh, psh, that's nothing. I got this. And things are going well for like a few hours. And then all of a sudden, I go to look at the, the one of these containers. And what these containers are doing is, again, don't worry about it. But you, uh, you interact with these containers via a web, web sites hosted, you know, one per container. And so I go to go to one of the containers via the web on, on my uh, MacBook Pro, and it just hangs. Like, n- there's no response. It's clear. It, it doesn't, you know, hang up on you, so to speak, and say, nope, the, it, there's nothing here. It just hangs. It's just waiting for a response from the web server. It doesn't get anything. So, huh, that's weird. So I restart Docker on the Mac Mini. Everything comes right back. I'm, I'm right as rain. Then I go to do something with one of these containers that involves a lot of network access, and all of a sudden, it hangs. Okay, that's weird. Restart the Docker, you know, restart Docker desktop, restart all these containers. Everything's right as rain again. I go through this cycle more times than I care to admit, and I come to realize just something ain't right here. And after doing a whole bunch of digging, it appears that running Docker desktop on a Mac, it's something you're supposed to be able to do, but is really unreliable. And I guess in, they're on version like 4.16 or something like that. And around version 4.12, they introduced a different way of interacting with the network stack on Mac OS. And apparently everything got real bad at that point. I, I tried to roll back all the way to 4.11 and it didn't make anything better. I am commenting on a couple of GitHub issues with regards to this, uh, with regard to this and, and I'm not really getting anywhere. So it occurs to me, okay, obviously I can't do this on the Mac Mini. I'd rather not do this on the Synology, even though by and large everything was working. It was just not as peppy as I wanted it to be. So if I can't do it on the Mac Mini, I can't do it on the Synology, and I don't think I want to do something like go to Linode and host it there. What else do I have left? Can either of you guess? Raspberry Pi? I can look in the show notes and know the answer. But <laughs> yes. <laughs> the, answer is, the answer is the Raspberry Pi. I have a Raspberry Pi 4, I think with two gigs of RAM. I bought it so long ago, I don't even remember. I have a Raspberry Pi 4 sitting here. Why don't I try that? Great. So, okay, I decide to install Docker on the Raspberry Pi. I load up one of my containers, and the container says, and I forget the exact error message, but something along the lines of, hey, this is the 32-bit version of me, and this is, like, not supported anymore. You really should be running the 64-bit version. Huh, okay. Well, do a little bit of digging and come to find out, oh, I'm running the 32-bit version of Raspbian, which is the Raspberry Pi OS, you know, their flavor of Linux, And there doesn't seem to be, understandably, any real upgrade path to the 64-bit version, or at least I I couldn't find one at the time. So now I've got to reload my entire Raspberry Pi. So what started as, huh, I wonder if I could make the Synology faster, (laughs) has gone through the Mac Mini into the Raspberry Pi, and now I am reloading my Raspberry Pi. (laughs) <laughs> now, Raspberry Pi it, it, it already has a fairly, a, you know, a fairly in, integral part in my networking life. It holds, it hosts my Marco, my Pi Hole, and it also <laughs> hosts my WireGuard VPN. And so, those are the two primary things it does. It does a couple of other things that are less important. But wh- any time I leave the house, I tend to want to be if I, if I'm on a Wi-Fi connection, not on cell. I don't bother when I'm on cellular. But if any time I leave the house on Wi-Fi. I really, 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 really feel safer and better if I am connected to my own VPN here at the house. And I really, really, really don't like the state of web advertising these days. So I prefer to have my pie hole in the house. And when I'm on the VPN, I get it for free anyway. So at this point, I, I, I realize, okay, I'm going to take this thing that second to the Synology, I would even potentially say it's more critical than the Mac Mini because I feel like my entire computing life is is wrong and upside down without the Raspberry Pi, where it's just my media empire that's wrong and upside down without the Mac Mini. So I decided, all right, we're going to give it a shot. So luckily I had a spare SD card, because remember the Raspberry Pi's hard drive is an SD card. I have a spare SD card, so I'm going to try and, you know, I'm going to leave the existing one alone. I'm not going to like format the one that I've already got. I'm just going to put it aside. And I'm going to start, I'm going to start anew on this new SD card. And so 
I reinstall everything. I I, re- I install a 64-bit version of Raspbian, which, by the way, is like only a few months old, I think, or maybe a couple of years old. This is a relatively recent uh, development. I install that. I install PyVPN for WireGuard. I install PyHole. I install all my things. I install Docker. At this point, I think to myself, okay, I, I should probably figure out what the hell Docker Compose is, and I teach myself how to use Docker Compose. About five minutes later, I decide I really hate YAML, so <laughs> there's that. Um, but nevertheless, I now have everything running on the Raspberry Pi. I have my four containers on the Raspberry Pi. Then later, I came back and decided, you know what, i got to figure out what this portainer thing is all about. I've had, I never really understood what that's about. I should give this a shot. Uh, short, short version, it's basically like a front end to managing all your uh, Docker containers. Uh, I got that installed. And so now I have my four, uh, don't worry about it, uh, look over there, containers that I really that were really critical and Portainer all running on the Raspberry Pi. And I thought this would now move the sluggishness from the Synology into the Raspberry Pi. But as far as I can tell, knock on wood, the Raspberry Pi also is laughing at the load from these four containers. So baby, I'm back and better than ever. And I am very happy with this. But I bring all this up just because it's so funny when you're a super nerd, how one small thing, it's like that Malcolm in the Middle clip. Do you remember that? Where he like comes home and decides he wants to change the oil in his car. And next thing you know, he's like rebuilding his bathroom mm-hmm. or something like that. I'm sure I have that wrong, but you get the yeah, idea. Yeah, I've seen the, I've seen um, the clip, yeah. It, so I, I started with, man, wouldn't it be nice if I could move this stuff off of the Synology to somehow reloading my Raspberry Pi from scratch, which ended up being not that big a deal. But it, when I started this, the, the, that portion of the project, I was like, oh, I don't know if this is going to go. This, this might not be a good idea at all. Um, the only problem that I have lingering at this point, other than everything I've just said, is that I really want to get myself a new Pi, a new Raspberry Pi 4, because they have an 8 gig of RAM version now. But I don't know if you two have happened to glance at all. <laughs> yeah, are they are they, get, are they uh, acquirable yet? No. Oh, no. Not unless you want to spend <laughs> way more money than you should. Uh, they actually, Raspberry Pi, just the foundation or whatever, just had a post in the last like week or two talking about uh, supply chain and how supposedly it's going to get way, way, way better starting really soon after the new year. Um, but nevertheless, it... I really would love a eight gigabyte Pi four, and I can't get my hands on one at the moment. Never, but with that said, my two gigabyte one, or it might be four actually, it might be four. I don't recall, but whatever it is, it's actually working really well, and I am really, really impressed that this little teeny tiny computer that I think was like forty or fifty bucks a couple of years ago is so happy with these containers. Now, granted, these containers happen to be fairly straightforward. There's not a lot to them, but it's working really well, and I'm really happy with it. And then yesterday, maybe the day before, I went back and thought, you know what? I bet I could connect Portainer to the uh, Docker instance running on the Synology because the the there were, like I said, like Homebridge is still there. There's a couple other uh, small ones that are unrelated to these four important ones that are still there. And so I thought, man, I should be able to get Portainer connected to the Synology. And it took a, a little bit of time because I made a bunch of dumb mistakes because I'm ignorant. But I learned, and I got it working, and man, I am happy. It went, Everything is clicked into place, and I'm very happy about it. In a perfect world, I would have preferred to have all this on the Mac Mini because it has so much spare power that it's not using. But I am really happy with where this is, and I, I, I'm glad that I spent all this time doing all this. I wish I didn't have to, but I'm glad I did. And I've learned from my mistakes. The key thing is, when it was all done... I wrote notes for myself. So when I eventually have to, for some reason or another, go back and do all this again, I'll have notes on what the hell I did. So I don't have to go spelunking in the Raspberry Pi file system realizing, oh, crap, I forgot this way off in the ether. Oh, crap, I forgot I made some com- you know, changes to Etsy or ETC or however you pronounce it, John. Uh, you know, Etsy, such and such and such and such. I need to go grab that file from the old hard drive. So I hopefully have pretty copious notes at this point. But uh, when, when you get Docker working and when Docker is on a... Uh, on a host that it actually wants to be on, Docker is pretty, pretty cool. It is, it is really impressive how quick you can go from nothing on a, on a device to having this entire uh, what, like stack or swarm, I don't even know the right terminology, but this entire group of four uh, containers run, up and running, lickety split. It is very good stuff. Did you hear the, uh, the description, the joke description of what Docker is? Uh, it was like a solution to the problem of a developer making software and saying, oh, it works on my computer. I don't know what the problem yeah. is. And the, <laughs> right. the, the solution was, okay, we're going to ship your computer. 
Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, what if every computer was your computer? Yeah, a little, little heavyweight. Uh, to that end, though, is your Mac Mini Intel? No, it's it's a uh, M1 Mac. I was Mini. gonna say if your Mac Mini was Intel, you just got to run a Linux VM and then run Docker inside the Linux VM because you because you do have the power to spare. Yes, and it's funny because a lot of people recommended doing exactly that. Like I both mean, you when can I still asked do that. I think you, can you still do that on on uh, ARM based Macs with Rosetta. I, think you can and it probably would be fast enough for the purposes i needed but i don't have a license like vmware fusion anymore i've never used parallels and i bet mm-hmm. i could probably work I this mean, up virtual with the box is another free one yeah but i, I never liked virtual box i just felt it was kind of gross but anyway i'm sorry because you do have the power to spare if you just run linux on your mac in a in a container or in some kind of virtualized container you could do it but then I'm, you know, putting a hat on a hat to use a Merlinism, and it's just, you know, there's a container in a container, and it just seemed like, it, and in a container, I mean, know. it would still be fine. Like what you're doing is working on a Raspberry Pi. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, you're right. You're right. But anyway, I just thought it was interesting, and 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 uh, even if none of that was interesting to you, I will say, as someone who doesn't really do web development anymore, I just the whole idea of Docker and having entire environments you know, installable as an app. I'm, I'm dr- dramatically oversimplifying, but that's kind of sort of what Docker does. That is really, really slick. And once you wrap your mind around it, it is really, really cool. And and if you've never dabbled with it, and I am, I'm not at the point that I'm like creating my own Docker, Docker containers or anything like that, but it is good stuff. You were using this a bunch uh, before you left your jobby job, yeah, right, John? Yeah, I put uh, my, my website, hypercritical.co. I've got a Docker container with it. Uh, not that it really... I just did it because I, I just got paranoid because I, I don't like running it in a Docker container. I don't really like the Docker desktop app, but I'm like, you know what? I should probably have a, a containerized version of my website. Uh, so now I do, uh, but I don't really mess with it. Yeah, I... It, I I never be I I you probably know more about it than I do at this point because I've forgotten so much. But I did use Docker Compose and plain old Docker and I looked into Docker Swarm and you know that it it is it is a fruitful area of investigation. But I never got to the point where I felt like I was comfortable with sort of running a production service off of Docker. So doing hobbyist things is about my level of comfort. Yeah, like I wouldn't advocate necessarily you know, running overcast through Docker, although uh, uh, I presume there's no reason why hypothetically one couldn't. But what is really... I, mean, I probably neat, should, honestly. <laughs> not, not the database, though. <laughs> <laughs> well, but what's really neat about it is, especially for development purposes, and I'm not saying that this is a problem that needs solving, Marco, but just for the sake of discussion, you could have like a Docker-composed YAML file, and once you stop vomiting over YAML, and I'm right there with you, you know, you, you could have this one file, and you can say to Docker, okay, Look at this file and stand up all the stuff you need to stand up in order to make an entire overcast system on this computer, which, again, I don't know that that's a need you really have. I would argue it's probably not. But just the fact that it can be done, I think, is pretty darn slick. 